welcome. If you would uh, take your seats, we'll begin our testimony in just a few minutes. Well, actually, we'll begin our testimony uh, after uh, my brief remarks. Um, one of my remarks is that I don't know my committee members by the backs of their heads as well as I do by the front of their heads. So <laughs> you don't need to hold your uh, name uh, uh, tag up, but if I get it wrong, please forgive me. Um, this is obviously an important issue, and we have uh, several people to speak on both sides of um, the issue relative to universal background checks. We uh, representatives are happy to be here um, representing you, and we work hard to do that. And we are respectful of your opinion, and I expect that you will be respectful of us and uh, our opinion. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, one of the, uh, there's a problem, uh, brief, a small problem at the uh, top of the list uh, relative to sponsors. We have two representatives with the last name Brown. One is Representative Brown, Rebecca Brown from the uh, Franconia area, and one is Representative Emerson Brown from the Portsmouth area. And it's Representative Emerson Brown who is a co-sponsor of this bill. The representatives of the Commerce Committee may be coming and going. Um, there are several bills being heard this afternoon, and they are sometimes prime sponsor or co-sponsor of those bills. So that is why, at least one of the reasons, why you may see them coming and going. Um, also, as the day wears on, um, some of them have to get back to their town for a town meeting or a selectman's meeting. Um, and uh, if the snow does descend, uh, that will be another issue that will impact us. It's my intention to be done with this hearing by five at the latest, and uh, before that, if we can. And about 3.30, I'd like to take a short break. If you have written testimony, please bring it forward uh, after or before, whichever you like uh, you have testified, um, and give it to uh, a representative at the desk in front of you that are at the front, and they will give it to the clerk. We hope that your testimony will be brief. Um, I understand that there's a lot of issues to discuss with this uh, bill, but we're going to hear from many different people from many different perspectives. So focus your uh, comments as best you can. And if you are here with someone of the same group and you can present together, that would be wonderful. I'm hoping that you can limit um, your testimony to three to five minutes at the most. And I think those are uh, the things that I want to say at the beginning. And uh, Senator, Senator David Pierce is a uh, co-sponsor of this bill. He has other bills to uh, present later today. And Representative Anders Kern has uh, said that he's uh, given her first spot to him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the committee for having me. Uh, I appreciate being able to go first of all in the Senate Commerce Committee, and uh, we have several bills today. I believe there, there are probably going to be a lot of data uh, presented today to try to justify why this bill should be passed, but I will try to stay away from that and then tell you just a personal story about why I support the bill. If you could speak out just a little bit. Uh, I grew up in Texas, hunting and guns part of the culture. Uh, we had guns in the house. I learned to hunt early on. And if you're really interested, I'll tell you about an alligator hunting story that men are alive in time. But I was never the target of gun violence, and I never really thought about why our gun laws are the way they are. I just assumed that unrestricted ownership of a gun was the way it should be. But then in 1996, I was mugged at gunpoint. I was walking down the street, and a 16-year-old kid pulled a gun on me, asked me for all my money. I was wearing sweatpants without any pockets. I had no money on me. He didn't believe me. Put the gun in my chest and said, come on, give me all your money. 
having a gun pointed up against your chest changes your perspective. Even though my background and DNA was hunting and guns, that will change my perspective. So it created a conflict within me. Do I continue supporting the unrestricted ownership and the use of the guns, or uh, do I take into account being the victim of gun violence? And the resolution that I came to in my own mind was to try to find the right balance between the right to own a gun and the right to be free from gun violence. And I believe that that's a value that we all share, especially as, as legislators, is to honor the Constitution that guarantees our freedom from overreaching government power, while still balancing those constitutional rights to guarantee our freedom from someone else's abuse. And in fact, if you read partners are the free of the New Hampshire Constitution, it says almost precisely that. For instance, we have the right to say what we want, when we want to say, but we can't abuse the right to freedom to speak by yellow fire in a crowded theater. We have the right to vote, but we don't have the right to vote twice. We have the right to have a gun for self-defense, but we don't have the right to have a gun to commit murder. Because we all know that with the rights guaranteed by the Constitution come with responsibilities to exercise those rights, quote, to ensure the protection of others, as our state constitution says, I believe we have some work to do to ensure to having common sense laws for the sale of firearms in this state. We have more work to do to fight against the reality that just today, on this single day, dozens of Americans will be murdered, hundreds of others shot, and nearly a thousand people robbed at gunpoint. We have more work to do because when I drop my kids off at school, I don't want to have to worry about their safety. And HB 1589 is the work that I believe this legislature must do. It is the common sense that has long been missing from our gun laws. It simply requires a background check for every firearm sale. It closes the gaping loophole that invites criminals, terrorists, and the violently mentally ill to purchase guns with no questions asked. The bill also has some very, I believe, important protections in it. In addition to the, to the uh, affirmative requirement, it exempts the transfer of firearms between immediate family members. It exempts uh, law enforcement or corrections agencies. It exempts the United States Marshal, the United States Marshal, or maybe the Armed Forces transfers. It exempts federally licensed gunsmiths who receive a firearm to work on. It excludes a common carrier, warehouseman, or other person engaged in the business of transportation or storage of a firearm. It excludes a person who acquired the firearm by operation of law presented to the death of the former owner of the firearm. And it excludes temporary transfers between spouses for the purposes of immediate self-defense that occur or that occur at an established shooting range authorized by the governing body of the jurisdiction. But another very important uh, element of the bill that I insisted on having in the bill before I signed on to it was that it expressly prohibits the creation of a government registry of anyone who goes through the background check uh, process and is able to purchase the firearm. Because I think and I think a lot of people agree, in fact, the polling shows 90% of the grand staters believe that closing these loopholes is the right thing to do. I think it is simply absurd to allow guns to be sold to felons or the dangerously mentally ill simply because some believe there are no responsibilities attached to the right to own a gun. The few minutes that it takes to complete a computerized check will certainly save lives. We owe it to ourselves and to our children to strike a fair balance between the Second Amendment and the right to be free from gun violence, because I believe support for the Second Amendment goes hand in hand with the responsibility of keeping guns out of the hands of criminals. I ask that we please thoughtfully consider House Bill 1589. Please read the state constitution's mandate that we balance rights and responsibilities and please do what common sense requires. I urge you to pass House Bill 1589. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, questions for Senator Pierce. Senator Pierce.
some people, we, we have obviously been getting a lot of emails on this issue, and uh, some people say that criminals are going to get guns anyway. So why is this bill, um, which isn't going to affect criminals that much, uh, before us? The uh, background check uh, law that we have on the books today, which says that uh, any purchase going through a licensed uh, firearms dealer has to conduct a background check. Those background checks have blocked the purchase of, uh, I believe, 1.5 million uh, firearms because the person attempting to purchase the gun had a criminal record or a record of violent mental illness or domestic abuse. And so the, the law works. Uh, if we close the loopholes in the law, I believe it will work even better because we're, in response to that question, we have a choice. In order to keep guns out of the hands of criminals, do we allow the loopholes to continue to exist where they already get guns? Or do we close the loopholes, which make it even, uh, make it more difficult for convicted felons and, and, and the like to get guns? Um, but also, I think there's a rhetorical response to it as well, because we all know that no law stops everything that we want to stop. If we know that the law against murder, for example, doesn't stop all murders, does that mean that we take the law against murder off the books? Of course not. But the fact that we can stop uh, criminals from getting guns and using it and perpetrating gun violence and perpetuating this really strong culture of death and violence that we have because of this, I think is the right step to take. Thank you. Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Senator for even though this bill specifically prohibits uh, creating a state registry, do you think that in any way this bill moves us closer to some form of, of ownership driving the firearms? I think that it's a, that's essentially the slippery slope argue, argument. Well, the bill can do no more than expressly prohibit the creation of a registry. And the, uh, the creation of a registry, if it happens, would violate the law. So there's nothing in the bill that can be any stronger than that express prohibition. So what you're talking about, again, is the slippery, slippery slope. And let's use an example. Should we not have to register our cars? Because then every car owner would be on record, and someday our cars could be confiscated. You know, it, it, I don't think it's a very strong argument to say that we can't pass a law because it might someday lead to something we don't like. Representative McNamara. I think there's a button on the bottom that you need to hold. Senator Pearson. Yes. Uh, I've been contacted by a constituent, and you might have addressed this, but Just one. Uh, their concern was uh, buying that uh, hunting rifle for their son when he, you know, he's graduated from high school or something like this, and about having to do a background check uh, for his son. Is that addressed in here? It is. It's, it's, it's expressly addressed. Um, and if you look, I've got the citation here. It exempts transfers between immediately fam immediate family members from the background check requirement. If you've got a, the bill in front of you, it's section 159-E colon 3 one that, that does that. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Representative Tucker. Thank you for taking my question. I noticed there's a fiscal note on this uh, to the tune of $200,000 uh, just for the first year alone in terms of implementing this bill. Do you have any indication as to how we are going to pay for that or where in the budget we're going to get the money because it, it continues on for the years to come? Right. I think it's, if, if, if it's the will of the legislature to try to stop criminals from getting guns, I think it would be incumbent will of the legislature to find the funding for that. We have uh, things that we put into law all the time that carry fiscal notes that uh, represent new expenditure items in the budget. And if it is the will of the legislature and the people to put that into law, the legislature does find the money to do that. And it may have to exchange it with something else that, um, you know, that goes by the wayside. But it depends on if, it, if 
if uh, background checks are what we want to do, I think we are, we're going to do it. Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Senator Pierce, uh, the Second Amendment, uh, don't background checks violate the Second Amendment? I've gotten a lot of those uh, emails saying it's a blank statement that they do. However, as you know, we've had background checks in federal law for over 20 years now, and many states have had background checks uh, as well. And they've all been tested in courts, both federal and state courts. They've always been upheld as constitutional. So um, it is the, I believe the constitutional question is settled on that, that it does not violate the Second Amendment. But I do want to draw particular attention to um, the case of District of Columbia versus Heller, which is a United States Supreme Court, in which the Supreme Court held that there is a personal right to own a handgun for, uh, for self-defense. But in that opinion, Justice, and about the quote here, Justice Scalia said, uh, the court's opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons or the mentally ill, laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of firearms. And that's exactly what House Bill 1589 does. And so not only have, have the entire laws and the specific laws of background checks been tested and approved by the courts, but Justice Scalia's own statement shows that uh, there is no room for finding those unconstitutional. Representative Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator, for coming in. Everybody would certainly like to see the silver bullet, no pun intended, that would cure the problem of gun violence. To the best of my recollection, in the tragic incidents that have happened in, across the U.S. over the last couple of years, I believe that in almost every instance, the gun has either been, uh, if a gun was used, it was used by somebody who had already passed a background check and then went off the rails, so to speak, or the weapon was stolen from somebody who had gone through a background check with and they had no control over this. If this legislation were in effect now, would it have prevented any of those tragic occurrences that have happened over the last few years? Well, let me answer the, the first statement you said that everyone's looking for the silver bullet, and this bill is not the silver bullet. There is nothing, as we've discussed before, there is no law that we can craft that will stop all gun violence. The point here is, do we take a step in the direction of stopping what we can? Uh, there are a couple of parents here from San Diego that will talk about, uh, even uh, admittedly uh, uh, testify, that a bill like this would not have stopped the Sandy Hook tragedy. But could it stop another Sandy Hook? Could it stop uh, murders in, at the race school in Hanover where my kids go to school? It is possible that it could. And as I uh, said to the chairman earlier, as between the choice of closing the loopholes or keeping the loopholes open where criminals can get guns, the, the policy choice I think is clear. If our shared goal, and I believe it should be our shared goal, is to stop as much gun violence as possible. Mr. Chairman, I need to get to Commerce. Thank you for your testimony. Right. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Uh, and hello. This is, uh, I appreciate your testimony. It doesn't make any noise, and uh, it won't disrupt the proceedings. Um, and uh, a couple of things that I missed. Uh, one is that the Vice Chair, Representative Schlackman, is a co-sponsor of this bill. When we co-sponsor bills, we're not allowed to um, uh, ask questions during the process of the uh, testimony, so that's why she is not asking questions. And a really important piece that I missed is that this is a, a two-bill uh, process in the House. We will hear this bill and get it out of our committee uh, by early March, but it will then go, if it passes the House in the first round, to the Criminal Justice Committee and will be heard again and will be processed to the House again. So it's important for you to know that uh, there will be an ongoing process, uh, even before it gets to the Senate, if it should get through the House. 
The prime sponsor of the bill is Representative Elaine Andrews Ahern. Representative? Good afternoon, Chairman Butler and members of the committee. Representative, speak right up oh, to the uh, thank okay. you. Uh, no, my glasses. Good afternoon, Chairman Butler and members of the committee. I am Elaine Andrews Ahern, the prime sponsor of House Bill 1589, and I want to thank you for holding this public hearing. Thank you to all of the people who came here today to show their support for this legislation and to demonstrate their concern for improved gun safety in New Hampshire. Thank you to Newcastle Promise, which encouraged, who encouraged me to introduce this bill, and thank you to all of our co-sponsors for their courage in tackling this very tough issue of gun violence. And I also want to thank my husband for coming with me today. Before I begin, I want to take a moment to recognize and especially thank two people who drove here from Newtown, Connecticut to be with us today. These are two members of Sandy Hook Promise whose precious children were killed on December 14th of 2012 at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Mr. Mark Barden, father of seven-year-old Daniel Barden, and Mrs. Nicole Hockley, mother of six-year-old Dylan Hockley. Their generosity of spirit and their commitment to ending the unspeakable gun violence in this country are quite humbling. And I believe that every person in this room admires their courage. Sandy Hook Promise is leading the way in helping all of us who care about these issues to work together with grace and dignity. Many people have come to speak today, so I intend to keep my statement very brief. But I wish to start by relating to you one particular story. This series of events took place in Wisconsin. In October of 2012, a 42-year-old woman named Zinnia Houghton got a restraining order against her husband, Radcliffe, after he had slashed her car tires and threatened to pour acid in her face, among other things. Zinnia told the court that his threats terrorized my every waking moment. Because of the resulting restraining order, Radcliffe became ineligible to purchase a gun under federal law. Unfortunately, he found a way around that. He found a gun from a private seller on the internet who, unlike federally licensed dealers, was not legally required to run a background check on him. This background check's loophole is how Mr. Houghton was able to arrange to buy a handgun for $500 in the parking lot of a McDonald's just days before, um, just days after receiving a restraining order. On October 21st, he took that gun to the spa where his wife worked, and there Mr. Houghton opened fire on the spa's pedicure station. Law enforcement officers said that he kept firing until he had killed his wife, two women she worked with, and injured four other women before he killed himself. If Wisconsin had had House Bill 1589 in place, Mr. Houghton would not have been able to buy that gun. The three people murdered would be alive, as well as Mr. Houghton himself, and four others would not have been wounded. The website that Mr. Houghton used to purchase this gun without a background check was armslist.com, which currently has 27 pages of guns for sale by private owners in New Hampshire, none of which would require the buyer to undergo a background check to ensure there isn't something that reasonably restricts them from owning or obtaining a gun. Background checks work. Since 1998, the FBI has rejected more than a million would-be sales to people who should not have access to guns. And when state-level rejections are factored in, that number jumps closer to two million. That's nearly two million felons, domestic abusers, and seriously mentally ill individuals who are not able to purchase a gun thanks to the National Instant Background Check System. It takes on average less than two minutes to complete an instant background check. That is relatively little time to delay someone who is rightfully purchasing a gun, and in return, our streets and communities are that much safer by helping keep guns out of the hands of those who we have all agreed should not have them. 
In my experience here in the State House, I have encountered a great deal of what I call magical thinking. People who believe that nothing bad can happen to me, that a terrible shooting could not happen here in New Hampshire, that crimes like that don't happen here. In Newtown, Connecticut, there had been one murder in the 10 years before the terrible shootings at Sandy Hook School. Adam Lonza was born in Exeter, New Hampshire. His mother lived in Kingston for many years. Colin Mutry, a lifetime New Hampshire Seacoast resident, shot four police officers before he murdered Greenland Police Chief Michael Maloney, Brettany Tibbetts, and then shot himself. He grew up less than a mile from my house in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire. He attended the same schools to educate our grandchildren today. We cannot address or prevent every act of gun violence, but we know that background checks do save lives. And that's a very good place to start, and it will begin to make a difference. I do not believe the policy recommended by House Bill 1589 should be viewed as a political issue. I believe that it is an issue of common sense and an issue of public health and safety for our communities. We want to ensure that people who are not supposed to purchase guns are less readily able to do so. I do not believe that this issue is the providence of one political party. I hope that this is one subject that can bring all of us together in a desire to protect the citizens of New Hampshire. In my experience, people seem to be afraid of changing things that they really don't understand. So I ask you, if we pass House Bill 1589, what is the worst thing that could happen? We could make it more difficult for people who should not have guns to have a gun. This means there will be fewer guns in the hands of dangerous people, and then maybe, just maybe, fewer people will be shot. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Van Rezering? Representative Samley. Mr. Chair. Uh, just out of curiosity, you're passing a law that would require people to uh, go to a dealer to uh, uh, go through the Insta Check program and uh, transfer to transfer their firearms. Isn't it logical that the only people who will go to the dealer are the law-abiding people anyway? Well, this would mandate that everyone who wants to buy a gun would have to go through to um, a dealer to. Um, Pass a background check, and there wouldn't be any other way for people to buy them. Follow oh. <laughs> this, is, this is really interesting Excuse because me. criminals, by definition, are people who don't obey the law, and if criminals decided to exchange firearms, there's nothing to stop them. We're trying to establish a law to make the state of New Hampshire safer. We cannot magically think that we have a solution to stopping criminals and what they may potentially do. I'm sorry, sir. Questions only from the committee. You're welcome to testify if you like. Any other questions from the committee? Thank you for your testimony, Representative. Thank you. Co-sponsor as well, Representative Catherine Rogers. Briefly, I gave to the chairman and members of the committee a rather lengthy memo speaking to some of the um, constitutional issues because I know a lot of you have questions on that. I will preface it by saying I am not a constitutional scholar, I'm a mere criminal lawyer. But my suggestion to the chairman is that um, if you all have a great deal of constitutional questions, I know there are the Second Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, and the Commerce Clause questions that you might have, that it might be advantageous for you to invite 
um, one of the constitutional law professors from the United School of Law to come and talk to you during a work session. This has been well litigated for over 200 years, the various issues involved, but that constitutional law professor might be able to answer your questions or definitely will be able to answer your questions much better than I. But just for a brief overview, the U.S. Constitution specifies the enumerated powers of the federal government. These powers have been interpreted broadly so as to create a large potential overlap with state authority. States generally legislate on all matters within their territorial jurisdiction. Criminal law, family law, property, contract and tort law, among others, are typical areas of law that are regulated at the state level. The United States Congress has relied on its authority under the famous Commerce Clause to enact legislated relative to firearms control over the course of a number of years. Since the 1930s, the U.S. Supreme Court has held that Congress has the ability to protect interstate commerce from burdens and obstructions, no matter what the source of the dangers which threaten it. In 1995, however, the Supreme Court revisited the scope of the Commerce Clause in a case you might have heard of called the United States v. Lopez. In Lopez, the court held that Congress had exceeded its constitutional authority when it passed the Gun-Free School Zone Acts of 1990. In their ruling, they made it a little bit clearer, and they said that the Congress had three broad areas that they could regulate under the Commerce Clause. The first was in the channels of commerce. The second, the instrumentalities of commerce in interstate travel, or interstate commerce. And third, activities which substantially affect interstate commerce. Since then, there's been any number of cases, as we all know, the uh, United States Supreme Court is never bored for lack of uh, cases to consider. In sum, what's come down over the course of the years is that Congress has the general authority to enact regulation under its Commerce Clause authority in those three activities um, that I related to just a moment ago. The basis of all this is that New Hampshire has the right to enact the House Bill you have in front of us today. Article 7 of our Constitution is the State Sovereignty Clause. To refresh your memories, I'm sure you all have it memorized. The article says, the people of the state have the sole and exclusive right of government themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, and do, and forever hereafter shall, exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not, or may not hereafter be, by them expressly delegated to the United States of America in Congress assembled. House Bill 1589 therefore fills a gap that takes authority under Article 7 of our Constitution and has a uniquely New Hampshire way to regulate the intrastate economic activity in the sale of transfers of arms. Senator Pierce talked about the uniquely New Hampshire way that we regulate that, the exemptions that have been carved out of the background checks. I think that they, two prime sponsors have talked a great deal about what the bill does. I just wanted to briefly give you an outline of why we can do it and how we can do it. And as I said, I gave to your chairman for distribution to you a fairly long memo, I think with three pages of legal sites that will give you some idea of the litigation that's taken place. And I think that um, if you have more lengthy questions about the amendments involved, I would suggest that one of the professors from the School of Law would probably be thrilled um, as I, my familiar with legal professors, especially con law professors, they love the chance to come and discuss the Constitution and the various cases that have taken place over the past 200 or so years. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Questions from the committee? Representative Tucker. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, I've got a question for you because in New Hampshire, our privacy issues are probably first and foremost if, of anything else. And I was just looking at page five of this um, where it says nothing construes that there should be any type of registry. But my question is, is where is the prohibition of that happening? I don't see it anywhere in here. Um, as I said, I think that that would be better related to either Representative Hearns, Andrews, Andrews Hearn, or Senator Pierce as far as the registry is concerned. They've been more involved with that. I'm, so I'm not trying to evade your question. I would be glad to get the answer and get back to you, but I think they could probably answer it better. Sorry. I hate not to be able to answer your question, Representative Tucker. I'm sorry. Representative Sandblade. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things that you said here was that um, this was a uniquely New Hampshire way of regulating firearm sales. The unusual thing about this piece of legislation is it looks very much like uh, draft law from the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. It's run by the Joyce Foundation out of San Francisco. Perhaps you can explain to me how a California solution is uniquely suited to New Hampshire. I don't think a California solution is uniquely suited to New Hampshire. I think as Senator Pierce said, what's unique to New Hampshire is the carve out of allowing transfers within a family, transfers that are mentioned specifically in the exemptions. And I think that Senator Pierce asked when it was being drafted that those things be done. And I think Senator Pierce is uniquely New Hampshire. Thank you for your testimony. And the final co-sponsor to speak, Representative David Borden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, hardworking members of the Commerce Committee. Um, where is a country, where we as a country have embedded in our Constitution the right to keep and bear arms, we know and we've said that from the very beginning of our republic that that does not apply to felons. I'm a gun owner. I was raised in a gun culture, which probably helped me become the best shot in the 87th Infantry Regiment of the 10th Mountain Division, where I was serving my country. Um, I'm not sure how that really helped my status, but uh, I was a good shot. When I was young, our local gun club in, in emphasized gun safety above all else, and our leaders warned us about letting guns get into the wrong hands. Unfortunately, I was only a few feet away when a demented person assassinated Bobby Kennedy. It was brought home to me that we need to figure out ways that we can prevent that. No law-abiding gun owner should worry about this bill. In fact, we should encourage it. Each time a person breaks the law with their gun, it casts a stain on all gun owners. A friend who is a gun shop owner in New, in New Hampshire has told me that the background check does, not, does no harm for him and only takes a few minutes. And he also expressed quietly that he was concerned that the law doesn't apply to every gun transfer. He says, that at least twice the police had shown up while the gun purchaser, prospective purchaser, was waiting to arrest the prospective purchaser as a wanted felon. Uh, so that in a part answers the, the question raised by one of your colleagues. So thank you very much. I urge you to support this bill. It's a, it makes common sense. Thank you for your testimony. Questions of Representative Borden? Thank you, sir. And other representatives who are here to speak on this bill and in opposition, Representative Hole. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee, Representative Hole, Merrimack 23. Thank you for clarifying before that the bill is going to criminal justice after work. Can I ask it, the chair, if you're going to speak on the floor, to make sure that that does in fact happen? If it uh, goes through the House in its first run, it will definitely go to criminal justice according to the majority leader uh, in a discussion right. about the bill. Thank you. And then you noted earlier on the sponsor had the wrong initial. Is that going to be corrected in the permanent journal as well? That should be, and I will follow it through. Thank you. I am speaking on behalf of several people here. I was written by a former state rep, Representative Brandon Guida, who asked me to read this letter, which I will turn in at the end. JR, I am unable to be in Concord for the hearing tomorrow. If possible, please submit the following letter to the committee. Members of Congress and Consumer Affairs, I ask the committee to determine that this legislation is inexpedient to legislate for the following reasons. The legislation infringes on the rights of law-abiding citizens by inconveniencing them and restricting their rights to the normal commerce as it has taken place in New Hampshire since its inception. Although legislation is normally proposed to fix a problem, in this instance, there is no problem to fix. I challenge the sponsors of this bill to point to a problem in New Hampshire 
i.e. one firearm related incident in New Hampshire that was caused by a private sale of firearm. Further, this legislation would not fix the problems that the sponsors allege exist. The legislation only will inconvenience law-abiding New Hampshire citizens, as there is no question that a criminal that wants to buy a gun cannot simply comply with the law to obtain a gun. Among other things, criminals can buy a gun on the black market from another criminal in another state, and they can and will steal what they need. I challenge the sponsors of this bill to show that this bill will solve the purported problem and not just affect the law-abiding citizens. In summary, this legislation attempts to provide a solution for a problem that does not exist in New Hampshire. However, the proposed solution does not solve the non-existent problem, as the only the law-abiding citizens will be affected. Respectfully, friends and Gunner. You'll give us a copy of that letter? Absolutely. Secondly, I would like to speak on behalf of New Hampshire Firearms Coalition. I, for the record, I am the board of the uh, Secretary of the Board. The New Hampshire Firearms Coalition is a membership organization representing manufacturers, dealers, and thousands of gun owners in the state of New Hampshire. As such, NHFC is strongly opposed to HB 1589, a bill that will put New Hampshire citizens in prison for up to seven years for selling a gun to a friend or a neighbor. That is correct. Under the provisions of HB 1589, a law-abiding gun owner would not be allowed to dispose of his or her personal private property without going to and through a licensed firearm dealer. This bill will criminalize commonplace activities about which you may not even think about. For example, have you ever loaned your rifle to a friend on a hunting trip? Perhaps one of you thought to let a friend try one of your guns at the shooting range. HB 1589 has passed these two kinds of things would, could land an otherwise law-abiding citizen in jail. In fact, HB 1589 is so broad, any transfer that is not completed by a licensed firearm dealer subjects a transfer to the penalties of a Class B felony. House Bill 1589 would set the stage for putting the names of the New Hampshire gun owners into a national gun registry by requiring that virtually every gun transaction in New Hampshire, private or commercial, it will be subject to a Brady background check. Thus, if you live in Stark or Fitzwilliam and wanted to sell your gun to a lifelong next door neighbor, you would have to take the day off and drive to a federal licensed firearm dealer. Once you got there, you might find out what frequent gun owners already know. The system is frequently down for long periods of time or are there delays, sometimes over even a weekend. And 8% of all Brady Law inquiries result in false positives, which means you're taking another trip back to the dealer. But that's not all. Recently, the BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, has gone into gun dealers in connection with its annual inspection and de demanded to be allowed a copy of all the information from the dealer's bound book, ATF 4473 Firearm Transaction Records, thus compiling a tobacco gun registry. I'm going to take a break for a minute from this. And if a dealer ever closes shop, those books go back to the FBI. I think people need to be aware that those books are in fact the record of every gun transaction and becomes the National Gun Registry, and it needs to stop. Sorry, that was my turn. So the drafters of House Bill 1589 claim that they prohibit a state or local firearms registry. Actually, the bill says the state shall not establish one. It doesn't say it prohibits one. Well, the BATF is not a state or local agency. It's a federal agency. Um, and it doesn't consider a list of all the gun owners to be a registry, so you will be making New Hampshire residents part of this federal gun registry. I could go on. There's a lot more to this letter. Um, I would ask that you read the letter fully. NHFC opposes this on all fronts, okay? Ask that you vote this bill and expedient to legislate, okay? Because we don't need a New Hampshire gun registry. Thank you for your testimony. Lastly, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's fine. I just want to note that I'm going to turn in the petitions from a bunch of people that were out in front of the State House on Sunday afternoon complaining about the fact that this is going on and had to work today. And they couldn't be here to testify. So I've got a stack of petitions signed in addition to all the people who signed in opposing this bill that are opposed to this. We need to stop this in New Hampshire. Okay? This will not save the lives. Thank you. Thank you. Will you take questions? Thank you. Um, you say that uh, friends who are hunting together or uh, people who are uh, on the shooting range together will not be legally allowed to, 
transfer their weapon, weapon to be used um, at that time. But the way I read the bill says that it would allow such transfers to occur. Uh, as I read the bill, um, they can't loan that rifle to go with somebody else on a hunting trip. Okay, that's a transfer. They can't loan, I'm sorry. They can't loan their rifle to a friend for their friend to use on a hunting trip. If there's a transfer, if there's a transferring quotes as the language is written, okay, both parties need to be at the range that day. Okay, I can't lend a firearm for someone to try it so they can go consider buying it and then let them go to the range and try it. That's, that's now a transfer. That's now a subject to a $35 fee. I won't even go into the fact, and it's part of my notes here, when Colorado tried to create a whole bunch of arcane laws, okay, that, okay, they drove companies out of the state. Same thing with Massive, uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. We have a strong firearms tradition. We have a lot of manufacturers here. In fact, um, Six Hour in Exeter is a big company. Rover, another big company. These employ thousands of people. The National Shooting Sporting Foundation believes that there's 5,000 jobs in the state of New Hampshire, and we're willing to risk that over this. This is a bad idea. It's a bad idea on multiple fronts. It's a bad idea because it's a gun registry uh, and sets in place for that to happen. It's a bad idea because it starts to take away the jobs from the people who actually work in the state. Your response clarified my question. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> Representative Baltasaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, fellow representatives, for the record, uh, Representative Al. Baldassau, Rockingham County, District 5, which is Londonderry. I come here today in order to speak to, uh, hopefully, to, uh, to you all to vote to ITL this bill. This bill is basically a feel-good bill. I heard the sponsor earlier talk about, well, it's not politics, it's not political. When I look at the bill, I don't see any Republicans on it, unless I'm missing something. Um, so that tells me it's a one-sided bill. My concerns with this bill here, if you take a look at the FBI uh, statistics, assault rifles are not, are not the issue by right here, are uh, weapons. Last year, a total of 12,000, this is in 2011, I should say, I say last year, 12,664 people were murdered. Hammers were used 496 times. Knives were used 1,694 times. Fist and feet were used 728 times. Rifles were used only 323 times. Is this, I ask you, is this a feel good bill? What happened to Sandy Hook? God bless them kids there, that, that's a shame that it happened. Should have never happened. But that's, this here law would never ever in a million years correct what went on over there. This bill goes after law by the citizens. We shouldn't be doing that. If anything, I, I bet you Republicans would team up with these Democrats on this bill and say, let's go after the criminals. Let's put two year mandatory jail time. If you're a felony, caught with a weapon. Let's put a year time frame. If you're a felony, caught with a knife, committing a robbery. A one year mandatory, a two year. Go after the criminals, not after the law-abiding citizens. New Hampshire, for many years, has been rated the number one state in the country, as the safest state in the country. Connecticut has major tight gun laws. New York does. Chicago, Detroit, Washington, D.C. All have tight gun laws. But yet that's where all the murders are going on. That's where all the killings are happening. This makes no sense. Two weeks prior to the shooting at the school in uh, Connecticut, in China, which has no guns, there was a killing of kids were attacked at a school with a knife. A couple of days before that, at a daycare center in China that has no guns now, with a hatchet. Children and teachers in China. Do a Google search on it. 
you'll find it. It happened a couple of weeks before it would happen in Connecticut. It's a shame. And we are going after the law-abiding citizens here in New Hampshire. Now, after reading the bill, this is a jobs bill. I understand my friends on the left want to put people to work. There's seven people that get a job out of this bill. If you look at the costs of the state, if you look at some of the comments in here also, private firearm sales are a significant public safety concern. Well, no kidding. We're all concerned with that. But the problem's not here in New Hampshire. The problem is in other states. Here in New Hampshire, we allow people to protect themselves wherever they have the right to be. You can't do that in a lot of states. Naturally, our crime is down. I'm asking you all today to definitely take a look at this and maybe look at stiffer penalties. Go after criminals. Go after them people there that are causing the crime. Go after the ones that our recidivization on the SB 500 did not work because many of them are going back to jail. Yeah, we say some at the cost of the taxpayer, but many went back to jail. Go after them. Do the three strikes you're out. Put the criminals in jail, and I guarantee we won't have any other problems in New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Questions for Representative Valisar, Representative Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative. Uh, I have one question for you, and that is, is that um, since the transfer of firearms to felons and other classes is already forbidden by uh, 18 U.S. Code 922 and RSA 159.7, uh, what need is there for this law? Well, that's a good question. Um, apparently, I would think maybe once it goes to criminal law, they'll figure it out because they'll be able to read the law, and I'm sure, God bless the sponsors, they mean well. But, you know, it's a feel good. The law is already in place. It's working. The law is already in place for transferring weapons. If I wanted to sell to my cousin or a friend, you have to know that person. The law is already there. We're going to fix something that's not broken here in New Hampshire. I hope the sponsors take a look and realize live free or die state is not Detroit, it's not Connecticut, not Washington, D.C. And let's ITL this bill. Other questions for Representative Baldassaro? Thank you for your testimony. Is Representative Christensen here? Thank you. One thing that we're missing in this particular bill is the psychotropic medications which affect many of the people that are involved in this. Um, Texas is on a military base. Even the feds are using psychotropic medications. And a officer shot up uh, many people down there. Okay? I've seen, I had a neighbor, a, a tenth grader. This wasn't with a gun. This was uh, a student in the tenth grade that was on Ritalin. And he was having some trouble with it. His mother took him to the doctor, who put that youngster on Paxil. About two weeks on Paxil, on a Saturday, he hung himself on Stonewood Lane in Hudson, okay, uh, in the oak tree behind his house. By the time the police and the fire got there, he was gone. She had got him out of the tree. It was written up in the newspaper that he fell out of the oak tree. You've got to control more than guns. Guns that are used and regulated by the Fed, and you cannot buy a gun in this country, in this state, without going through federal checkups. I've been there uh, many times when sales are made of peach gun and tackle in Hudson, and it, it, uh, sometimes they're busy and it takes a while, but they make the checkup before they make the sale, okay? And anybody who is selling guns without doing this uh, at, at some of these gun shows are breaking the law, we should lock them up. So that's all I have to say about that. This is more than guns. This is Thank medication. You. Thank you, Representative Christensen. Questions for the representative? Thank you, sir. 
Uh, next, could we hear from Nicole Hockley from Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Thank you for coming, Ms. Hockley. Thank you very much for having me. Um, just over one year ago, on December 14, 2012, my husband Ian and I lost our beautiful six-year-old son, Dylan, killed in his first grade classroom at Sand Hill Elementary School. Our older son, Jake, who was also at the school that day, lost his beloved little brother. And overall, 26 families from Newtown had their worst nightmares become reality, and an entire community and country felt the impact. So why am I here today, and what do I hope to do? Well, it's to support this House bill. Because regardless of any inconvenience of a few minutes in terms of doing a background check, regardless of how safe you think your community is going into something like this, and the fact that every law-abiding citizen is law-abiding until they commit an act of violence, I just want to tell you that nothing can prepare a parent for the death of their child. Nothing can prepare you for the horror of viewing your child's body in a casket, or of picking out their urn, or receiving back their destroyed clothing, or waking every morning without feeling their embrace. Nothing can prepare you for not trying to stare at the empty chair at the dining room table, or about how you keep the door closed to the one room that holds all the boxes with their clothes and toys. Nothing prepares you for how loud the silence can be when hearing your surviving child play by himself when there used to be the joyful noise of two. I certainly wasn't prepared for this pain in my life, and it's my most sincere wish that no other parent ever has to experience this heartache. The day before Dylan was killed, on 12-13, I was just another person, another mom who really knew nothing about gun violence, politics, lobbying, activism, or how to create social change. I was like so many other people, part of the silent majority in this country, I would hear about tragic acts of violence in the news, think how awful it was, and then look away and return to my busy daily life. And while I'll always remain a mom to both Dylan and Jake, my role in life forever changed after 1214. I can never look away now. I'm now committed to my work with Sandy Hook Promise and its mission to reduce the causes of gun violence and save lives. I promise to do all I can to make sure that no other parent and no other family has to go what I'm going through what the other families of Sandy Hook are going through, and what more than 12,000 families are currently going through as a result of gun violence, excluding suicide, just since 1214. And that's a death toll that continues to increase every day. So I want to thank you for allowing me to speak here today in support of House Bill 1589. This bill could very well spare New Hampshire families unimaginable heartache and pain and its passage will save lives without interfering with Second Amendment rights. In the absence of federal legislation, it's important to explore all reasonable options within our states and communities to help prevent and reduce gun violence. If there's more that we can do to keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them, convicted criminals, domestic abusers, and those whose mental illness makes them a dangerous to themselves or others, it's just common sense to take those steps. If there's more that we can do to stop illegal gun trafficking between states and save lives elsewhere, it's just common sense to take those steps. House Bill 1589 will have no impact on the vast majority of gun owners and purchasers who are responsible law-abiding citizens. It will have no impact on constitutional rights. It will still allow for transactions between family members, but will ensure that background checks are provided for private sales through federally licensed dealers. And with 90% of New Hampshire constituents supporting background checks, it's a great place to start. If taking these sensible steps can help save lives in the future, then you need to take them. Because who is against not saving life? This is really special to us because New Hampshire is our neighbor. And it is well known that people from states like Connecticut that have closed the background check loophole system come to New Hampshire to buy guns. This law would not have stopped the deranged young man who murdered my son, but it will save, could very well save, someone else's son or daughter or mother or father. And I'll repeat, background checks did not save Dylan's life. Many of the laws being considered in our country may not have saved him. 
Connecticut already had strong gun laws and a shooter was still able to take 26 lives from us. But that will not stop parents like Mark and I from advocating for stronger background checks and sensible solutions that will prevent gun violence and help save the lives of others. Just because we couldn't save our children is no reason not to try and save yours. Because we know the price of inaction. Every day of inaction means more lives are lost. We know that this is not just a suburban problem or an urban problem, it is a nationwide problem, it is all our problem, and it's up to all of us to help solve, state by state. As a parent to nine-year-old Jake, I feel it's my duty to protect him, his friends, and all our children from this kind of violence. But as a parent to Dylan, it's for Dylan and the other children that die everywhere that compel me to work and speak out every day so that their deaths will be remembered as what drove us to finally work side by side in order to do what's right. We simply cannot be a people that tolerate this level of violence. We cannot be a people that turn away from the issue because it's too sad or too hard or too confrontational or too political. We're just parents advocating on behalf of our children like all parents do. And it doesn't matter whether I'm a gun owner or not, or whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat. I'm weary of the constant fighting between gun control and gun freedom. As a people, why can't we focus less on our differences and more on our similarities? We love our children, and that common bond we all share is what must compel us to find common ground and sensible solutions to save lives. Because if even one more child can be saved, isn't it our moral obligation to do that? If the price of inaction is the death of just one more child, how can we just sit by? What happened in Newtown can happen anywhere. No community is immune. I'm no different from any of you, and any one of you could be in my position. And that's why it's important to make meaningful changes now. So please support House Bill 1589 and help keep guns out of the hands of people who should not have them. Explore all the sensible solutions that will help prevent gun violence in New Hampshire. And as one of the previous speakers said, perhaps there should be stronger enforcement laws if a felon is found with a firearm. I'm all for that personally. I'd also very much like to see the firearm not be in the hands of the felon in the first place. Don't wait until it happens in your community before taking action. Don't look away and risk having our tragedy become yours. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, questions? Thank you. Questions for Ms. Hoffman? Thank you very much. Thank you. And Mark Barton, also from the San Diego Pro uh, Promise. The next three speakers will be Kevin Bloom, James Demers, and Caitlin Rollo, if you would uh, like to prepare. Thank you, Mr. Barton, for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, and thank you, all of you, for being here to hear this, these remarks on this very important issue. My name is Mark Barton, and just over a year ago, on December 14, 2012, Every parent's worst nightmare became a horrible reality for me. My sweet little son Daniel was murdered in his first grade classroom at Sandy Hook Elementary. Daniel was seven years old. I'm here today on behalf of my wife Jackie, my children James and Natalie, and most important for, importantly for Daniel, to advocate on the behalf of life-saving legislation here in New Hampshire. Daniel was a constant light of pure love and happiness and compassion in our home and everywhere he went. Everyone who met Daniel Barton was touched by his sweet kindness. I tell you this because, so you can understand why it's so important for me to be here today. Because as a parent, I feel a moral obligation to ensure that no other children are killed by gun violence. And no other parent has to suffer what Jackie and I and thousands of parents are experiencing every day. I'm here be today because I know the New Hampshire House Bill 1589 will save lives. This is not about politics, this is about basic public safety. We all agree that violent criminals should not be able to purchase firearms. Having a background check accompany only some sales is like fixing only part of the hole in your boat. And in fact, this is really not new legislation at all. 
Background checks have been in place at your local gun shop and sporting good dealers for over 20 years. And as such, responsible, law-abiding gun owners won't be affected by House Bill 1589 at all. House Bill 1589 simply makes all firearm sales and transfers in New Hampshire equal. And we've all heard the provisions that come along with that so that folks won't get ensnared in this. And in other words, like Representative Baldessaro just said, let's go after the criminals. Nicole and I now work with the nonprofit organization Sandy Hook Promise. At Sandy Hook Promise, we are addressing the causes of gun violence from a broad perspective. We would like to change the conversation and find ways to solve this problem with all of you together. In addition to gun safety, we ad advocate for policies and initiatives that improve our mental health care. We are also developing programs and tools that will address social isolation and community connectedness. We will continue to advocate for positive change because we believe that we can save lives of other children and help other parents from knowing this heartache. When parents come together bound by the love for their children, we know that common sense will prevail over partisan politics. The strength of parents' love can bring people of goodwill together to fight for better outcomes for all of our children. One day, my little Daniel's death will no longer be just an enormous tragedy for us. It will be a moment of transformation for a nation that has somehow become too accepting of this endless stream of senseless shootings, each of which leaves families devastated and communities terrorized. Daniel was a special little boy. I know every parent says that, but Daniel really had a beautiful gift for noticing and seeking out the child sitting alone and bringing him into the conversation. And when he died, my niece started a Facebook page that encouraged people to ask themselves, what would Daniel do? This little Facebook page has inspired thousands of stories of kindness and compassion and enlighten us every day. And when I was considering whether to leave my family to come here today, I just asked myself, what would Daniel do? And the answer was simple. He would be here, helping you here in New Hampshire to lead the way toward a safer national community for all of us. Daniel would have done that, and I'm here for Daniel, because he can't be here. I'm here for all the children who are lost, and to ensure that no others will be. I hold my Second Amendment rights sacred to me, and I do not intend to share them with criminals, felons, and terrorists. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Questions of Mr. Varden? Thank you very much for coming. Kevin Blue, are you here? Great, we, we meet again. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'll be very brief, uh, as I realize there are many people that want to speak after me. And uh, just a, a brief response to some of Senator Pierce's comments. 1996, when Senator Pierce was confronted by a 16-year-old mugger, it was unlawful to sell a gun, a handgun, to a child. Armed robbery is also illegal. Uh, it's also a crime to sell a gun to a felon, as other people have pointed out. It's unlawful to commit murder. Uh, now, essentially what this bill is doing, it's asking the federal government to safeguard our privacy, the privacy of everyone in New Hampshire, the federal government that has sold guns to Mexican drug cartels that resulted in the murder of many people. Um, also, a federal government that we have trusted not to read our mail, to listen to our, read our email, to listen to our phone calls, and collect data about us constantly I think it's very misguided to trust the federal government to do anything of the sort. I'm sorry about the murders at Sandy Hook, and I appreciate the sentiment that people would want to assure that no child is ever killed by a gun again. However, as it's been admitted, this bill would not have done that. Also, last year, 1,400 children died in swimming pools. Their deaths are equally tragic, but we cannot solve that problem by federal legislation either, or submitting people who want to buy pools to a criminal gun check. Thank you. Mr. Bloom, this is not federal legislation. This will be state legislation if it, if it were to pass. But federal gun checks are, the checks are submitted to the federal Understood. Government. Questions for Mr. Bloom? Thank you. Mr. Demers? Good afternoon to the committee. Uh, Jim Demers is actually unavailable right now. He's in another meeting, but my name is John Pearson, and I work with Mr. Demers, with Demers and Blaisdell, and I just have um, language that Jim wanted to submit to the committee, 
And so I'm just here to send his regards and let you all know that he'll be available in the subcommittee work session on this language. So I just wanted to submit this to the committee if that's possible. And your name is Mr. Pearson? Yes. Okay. Yep. And it, it, Pearson. Yes. And if you would submit your language to the clerk, that would be great. Or just here to the desk and we'll pass it back. Thank you. Caitlin Rolo from Granite State Progress. And uh, the next three people will be Ian Underwood, Tony Ryan, and Ralph D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Caitlin Rolo, and I'm the political director of Granite State Progress, a multi issue advocacy organization working on issues of immediate state and local concern. We are here today in support of HB 1589. In absence of congressional action, it is important that states, states explore other options for preventing or reducing gun violence in our communities. HB 1589 would require background checks for all gun sales, helping keep guns out of the hands of felons, domestic abusers, and seriously mentally ill by referring background checks for all gun transfers. Under HB 1589, Private sellers would be required to conduct background checks through federally licensed dealers using the same background check system already used in all dealer sales. The bill makes common sense exceptions for gifts or loans among family members. The last time the New Hampshire General Court discussed this issue was 15 years ago in 1999. In 1999, I was a freshman at Trinity High School. Computers occupied a lot of space on your desk Cell phones were rare, and Columbine would not happen until April. Today, my phone is a mini computer that I can carry with me everywhere. In fact, with a sweep of my finger and a punch of a few buttons, I can go online and arrange to purchase a gun within minutes. So long as I can click the button saying, yes, I'm allowed to purchase a gun, no questions asked, no background check. According to the fiscal note at the end of this bill, an estimated 33,333 gun sales in New Hampshire last year did not go through the background check process. At the same time, an overwhelming 89% of grant stairs support expanding criminal background checks to cover all firearm sales, a measure which will keep guns out of the hands of felons, domestic abusers, and the seriously mentally ill, and save lives. It's time we had this conversation in New Hampshire. In the absence of action on the federal level, states must explore options for preventing or reducing gun violence in our own communities. HB 1589 is a smart policy measure with widespread public support. We urge you to pass this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Underwood. And then Tony Ryan. If you would uh, get ready to speak, please, Mr. Ryan. Um, thank you for allowing me to testify. Um, I'm here to oppose the bill. Uh, Article 2A of the New Hampshire Constitution clearly states that all persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and the state. It doesn't say some persons. It doesn't say approved persons. It doesn't say persons who don't scare us. It says all persons. A right for which we have to ask permission isn't a right at all. And so the first point, I think, that has to be made regarding this bill is that it takes the wrong approach towards the goal sought by its sponsors. The right approach would be to amend the New Hampshire Constitution to declare that not all persons have the right to defend themselves or that self-defense is a privilege or perhaps to change the definition of persons to something like persons we like. But until such a change has been made, any fifth grader can see that this bill conflicts with the New Hampshire Constitution. It takes a constitutional scholar to miss that. <laughs> Clearly, the sponsors of the bill don't feel the need to go to the trouble of amending the Constitution. And that's partly because, as we all know, many judges would be happy to tap dance around any constitutional challenge by changing the meanings of words like all, by creating balancing tests out of thin air and so on. But I urge the committee to consider a couple of deeper, less obvious consequences, not just of passing a bill like this, but of even bringing it up for consideration. The first is that a bill like this undermines respect for the very rule of law itself. After all, 
if the legislature isn't going to respect the limits placed on it by the New Hampshire Constitution, why should individuals respect any limits placed on them by that legislature, whether regarding guns or schools or traffic laws or anything else? If we're going to disregard the big rules, why pay any attention to the smaller ones? For that matter, if words like all and person no longer mean what they've meant for centuries, then why should we pretend that laws, which are made of words, mean anything at all? In other words, if you can behave as if all doesn't mean all, why can't I behave as if not doesn't mean not? The second thing is that one of the things that all persons have the right to defend themselves against is their own government. When, in the words of Article 10, the ends of government are perverted, the people have not just the right, but the duty to reform or replace that government, something that might require the use of force. It's for this reason that an explicit right of revolution is recognized by the New Hampshire Constitution. And it's for this reason that it is absurd to give a government you may someday have to fight any say at all over what arms you have. And this bill does pervert the ends of government by seeking to force people to make this choice. You can be free or you can obey the law, but not both. So the great irony here is that the very existence of this bill and others like it is the strongest argument for why, even if passed, they should simply be ignored, even though that would make felons out of people who are harming no one, but who simply decline to let the fears of a few undermine the freedom of all. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your testimony, Representative McNamara. In my briefcase, I carry a copy of the state constitution with me at all times, and I noticed the chapter uh, which comes next, you uh, refer to Article 2A. Article 3 states, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others, and without such an equivalent, the surrender is void, so that we can have rules and we have freedoms, but sometimes they come together. The same document also says that there are certain rights that cannot be given up because no equivalent can be given for them. And I would argue that this is one of those. Thank you for your comments. And Mr. Ryan, uh, Tony Ryan. My name, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Tony Ryan, I'm from Lyon, New Hampshire. I'm speaking for myself and my wife, and she's here in this room with me to get today. I'm also speaking as a seven year, uh, 20 plus year uh, former police officer, and I was a chief of police in a small town of Lyon for seven years. Uh, we wish to register our strongest objection to House Bill 1589, which would require all transfers of firearms uh, to be processed uh, through a federally licensed dealer. While this bill purports to pre prevent undesirables from acquiring firearms, it does so through a process which is designed to track the movement and the possession of these arms only by those law-abiding enough to submit to the requirements of this bill. This is de facto gun registration. It is well known that registration, even when put into place by increments, eventually devolves to confiscation. It's not lost on us that this bill, like others designed to make legal possession of firearms more difficult and eventually impossible, comes in response to a number of horrible mass killings by deranged individuals. It's equally apparent to us, and hopefully to you as well, that possession of the firearms involved in every one of these incidents would not have been prevented by the measures which HB 1589 proposes. This is purely an anti-gun bill which seizes opportunistically on these unfortunate tragedies. We urge you to vote this bill in expedient to legislate. 
Thank you for your comments. I have one more comment I'd like to make, and I really hes hesitate to make it, debate it with, within myself whether I should. And I certainly do not mean to uh, diminish the horror of the, the Sandy Hook tragedies, but I do question the appropriateness of citizens of another state testifying uh, against a New Hampshire bill. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it is possible for anyone to testify in front of the committee if they have an interest in a bill, whether they live here or elsewhere. And that has occurred in the past and will in the future. Thank you. Do you have any further questions? Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, that's it. We have lots of uh, uh, interest and uh, passion relative to these issues, but please do not applaud. And if you need to give a positive comment uh, or uh, applause, you can do it silently like that. Um, after Ralph D'Amico, or D'Amico, I'm not sure how to say your last name, uh, testifies, then we will have Reverend Carla Bailey, Jack Kimball, and Stephen Stephan. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having this hearing today and giving us all the opportunity uh, to render our opinions. For the record, my name is Ralph D'Amico. I own Riley Sports Shop. I'm a firearms dealer. I have been a firearms dealer uh, for 20 some odd years. I've worked at Riley's for 40 years, and Riley's has been in business 60 years. I have nothing short of a tremendous amount of experience in the area of firearms law. I'd like to consider myself somewhat of an expert uh, in terms of uh, the law as it applies to sales. I'm opposed to this bill on a couple of levels. Um, it's been brought up on several occasions that do you actually suppose that someone intent on committing mayhem with a firearm is either going to go through a background check or will not seek that firearm somewhere else. I've been studying uh, rather intensely the uh, firearms uh, FBI Uniform Crime Report. It's not called the FBI Crime Report anymore. It's a Uniform Crime Report. Statistically, this country is on a 16-year decline in violent crime. It's hard to believe because what we see in the media every day would suggest otherwise. It is, however, true, with the exception of a few states. Under the federal, under the state law in this state, you cannot transfer a handgun to anyone who is not personally known to you. Implied in that law is the fact if you personally know someone, that they are of good character. You are held to that standard. Under the federal law, you cannot, you must, first of all, uh, you can't transfer a firearm to someone outside, or you can not accept a firearm from anyone from outside as a state of New Hampshire resident. It has to be between state residents. Under the federal law, it says that it is illegal for anyone to transfer a firearm <coughs> to a prohibited person, and there are nine classifications of prohibited person on the 4473 form that I will submit to the committee. So we have laws in place right now um, that in some instances are not obeyed. How do we ensure that this law would have anybody paying attention to it? I submit to you that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We may want a little bit of security by giving up a little bit of freedom, and we're not going to get it. Now, as I understand it, Sandy Hook, the state of Connecticut, has a safe storage law. And as I understand it, that safe storage law did not prevent Mr. Lanza from wreaking that unspeakable tragedy on these poor people from the state of Connecticut. <clears throat> Believe it or not, firearms are used in less than 50% of the, the violent crimes in the state of New Hampshire. 38% of murders in New Hampshire are committed with a firearm. All the rest are the means. 
robberies. 25% of robberies in New Hampshire are committed with a firearm. All the others are the means. Aggravated assault. 17.6% of aggravated assaults are committed using a firearm. Everything else, other means. What I'm trying to say is that one crime is probably too much. However, we cannot insulate ourselves from reality. The reality is there are those people out there every day who will have no regard for you, no regard for the law. If everyone were to abide by the law, I would think that this would be ideal. It's not going to happen. As a firearms dealer, I could stand to make quite a bit of money on this law. At $25 to $50 per transfer, no brainer. In principle, I think it's wrong, and this committee should really consider uh, the impact of, of what you're uh, looking at. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Murphy has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, I imagine you do your share of transfers uh, and background checks at your business. Do you, can you speak to the incidence of false positives? Does that happen often at all, ever? And how do you handle it when it happens? I could give you stories on false positives. I have had people denied for bench warrants for parking tickets in the city of Boston. I've had people denied for motor vehicle violations in the state of New Hampshire. Um, on the state level, uh, we're fortunate to have a very efficient system, thanks to uh, New, New Hampshire State Police, whereby records can be cleared up with a simple inquiry. On the federal level, it's almost impossible. There are false positives. There are people who 25, 30 years ago uh, pled to some charge because their court-appointed attorney said to do that, not realizing the implications were, f were felonious in the future and cannot get out from under the system. So there are false positives. Thank you. Representative Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for coming. One of the things that I'm wondering about is um, we have this assumption that seems to underlie this bill that if this goes through, there won't be a black market in uh, firearms. Um, how likely do you think that is to not happen? Highly unlikely. <laughs> We, we know what happens. Um, I, have, I, I have no doubt uh, that ill-intentioned people will find a way uh, to either avoid a background check, if they know they're prohibited, they will say, I'm not going to even bother with that, it won't prevent them. They'll go elsewhere, they'll go on the street, uh, they'll steal them, uh, they will find some willing person to, to sell them a firearm. But the law will not be served well by it by those people. Representative Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. In your experience, have you ever known or heard of anyone who was honest enough to submit themselves to a background check, while at the same time being malicious enough to intend to inflict harm on other people uh, with the weapon that they purchased? Can't imagine that would be possible, sir. Thank you for your testimony. <coughs> Reverend Carla Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, for this hearing today. My name is Carla Bailey. I am the senior pastor of the Church of Christ at Dartmouth College, where we have been, among many other things, trying to debate, discuss, and advocate for a variety of ways to make safety for our children a high priority and still keep to the aspirational goals of our faith of nonviolence. In that effort, one of the things that we have done is to hear from Senator David Pierce, who I am happy to say is also one of my parishioners. One of the things that Senator Pierce has helped us to understand is that there is no silver bullet, so to speak. There is no panacea that will protect us legislatively from violent crime completely. 
But there, that's not, that does not mean that there are not intermediate steps, and those are the intermediate steps to which we seek now to address ourselves. I am here to say something to you about background checks. I've been in ministry for 37 years. When I began in ministry, there was no such thing as professional malpractice insurance for clergy. That has obviously since changed. Also, no one would have considered asking a clergy person to submit herself or himself to a background check. And now in the United Church of Christ, the denomination in which I hold my ministerial standing, we may not be considered for a new position. By When I say we may not, I mean we will not be allowed to be considered for a new position in our denomination without submitting to a criminal background check. We have a whole series of changes that we're dealing with in our culture, helping us to understand how difficult it is to protect people who are vulnerable. At first, the idea of a criminal background check of me gave me great offense. How dare they? But I have to tell you, if this protects a child in some other congregation, then I will submit myself to the slight indignity that a background check might impose. Secondly, the issue of domestic violence is one that is very close to my heart and we have not spent a great deal of time talking about that in this hearing today. When I leave here today, I will go directly back to Lebanon, to WISE Center for Women, to run a support group that I run every week for women who are trying to get free of domestic violence and sexual assault traumatic situations in their lives. There is absolutely no question Every credible study says that when a firearm is made available in a home, the likelihood of a fatality in a domestic abuse situation rises exponentially. So when people are given the opportunity, women given the opportunity to impose or to ask a court to impose a restraining order, and that is registered somehow as it, as it would be in a court proceeding, if that prevents a um, domestic partner from getting or purchasing illegally uh, a firearm, then that possibly, it's possible, it could save the life of a woman or her children. We can't prove the negative. We can't say how many lives are saved. We can only look to the horrible lives that are lost and hope that we can do better. And that's why I'm here today to testify in favor of this bill and urge you, committee, to pass it on for further consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Hammond has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would you believe, Reverend, that I had to do a background check one time so that I could teach Sunday school? Right. I do believe that. I think that is one of the things that um, every church is increasingly looking at, in part because of the safety issue, of course, that I talked about, but also because of insurance policies and insurance carriers who are saying to churches, we want you to be more protective of your children and to limit or diminish the possible risk. And to do that, we expect that you will do a background check, appropriate background checks on all of your volunteers who work with any minors. I also just finished law school recently, and it, I'm in the process of trying to be admitted to the New Hampshire bar. The background check we're looking at for the purchase of a firearm pales by comparison to what people who are trying to gain admission to the New Hampshire bar go through in terms of being explored uh, for criminal background checks, character and fitness and whatnot. I think it's just common sense that we submit ourselves when we, are, when we hold the trust of people, uh, that we submit ourselves to what is really a very minor indignity 
compared to the safety that it can promote. Thank you, Representative Jones has a question and doesn't have a microphone. I'm sorry that I don't have it handy with me, but I am more than happy to submit it to the committee. Um, it, there's a number of studies that are showing both that if a firearm is prior in the home, previously been discipline in the home, prior to a restraining order being sought, there are statistics about that. But now there are also emerging statistics about once a restraining order has been sought and then a domestic partner goes out to seek a firearm, that then those firearms are almost inevitably having to be purchased on the black market. So I would be more than happy to find those studies and make sure that you get them either through Senator Pierce or directly to your committee. Follow up. Thank you. I'd be happy to do that, and thank you for asking for it. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Jack Kimball. And uh, if you could make it three minutes instead of five, we would appreciate it. Jeez, I can't believe that. <clears throat> My name's Jack Kimball. I'm from Dover, New Hampshire, and I stand before you opposed to this bill, it's an outrageous bill. The right for the, keep, the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's a succinct comment. There's no gray area. It is what it is, it means what it says. This bill will do only one thing. It will turn thousands of law-abiding New Hampshire citizens into felons because I don't intend to comply with this bill, and I will guarantee you that many of the others in this room, if this bill ever should pass, will not comply, and we are law-abiding, tax-paying citizens, should we go to prison for seven years? Really? I took an oath as a young sailor to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America from all enemies, foreign and domestic. A lot of veterans are also in this room. All of you took a similar oath when you took office. The sponsor of this bill and the co-sponsors took a similar oath. In my view, every one of them have all already shown a willingness to violate that oath. You should not run for office if you're not willing to honor your oath and your word. Integrity matters. I am sick and tired of having to come here to these hallowed halls to continue to defend the God-given rights that we all have. It should be unnecessary. This bill shouldn't see the light of day. And quite frankly, my opinion is that each and every one of these sponsors should step down today. You don't belong here. There will be no applause or you'll be ejected from the room. Thank you. Very quickly, I have two granddaughters, Rochester school system. When Sandy Hook occurred the day after it happened, my 13 year old, she's 14 now, 13 year old, came to my house. Everyone was upset. All of us were. We hated to see this happen. I was in tears. Who wouldn't be? But my 13 year old said we have the same system, same security system that Sandy Hook had. And that guy shot right through the door and came in the room. And we always wonder in lockdown when we're in the corner of the room, what's going to happen if somebody breaks through that door? We're all down the corner. I said, well, what are you thinking about? She says, I'm going to go out the window. I said, you're on the second floor. She said, I know. I said, well, what do you think should happen? This is a 13-year-old. She gets it. She said, we should arm and train willing teachers and put a sign outside that says warning. If you intend to harm our kids, you'll be met with deadly force. Teachers are armed and trained. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you for your silent uh, support of that testimony. Stephen Step, is it uh, Stefanik or Stefanik? Stefanik. Stefanik. 
For the record, my name is Steven Stefanik. I am from a lifelong resident of Manchester, New Hampshire, District 16, Ward 9. I was a teacher for over 32 years. As long as I've lived in this state, I've had firearms. I've bought and I've sold firearms from friends and associates and fellow hunters and gamesmen all my life. Why are you going to penalize me? If you're going to make me a felon, I've said this to every committee that I've testified in front of, for every anti-gun bill that's come before this legislature, you make me a felon, I will become a felon. I'm going to touch upon a few things that some of the people who previously spoke said that I'm going to uh, negate. Uh, a representative earlier made reference to the um, um, Commerce Clause as it relates to the Tenth Amendment. She cited a case study. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a science teacher. That's the United States versus Lopez, where the court confronted a conviction of a 12th grade student for carrying a concealed handgun into school in violation of the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990. I'm going to cut to the short of it. And that is that the federal government, uh, rather the Supreme Court, ruled that the federal government did not have the power to regulate unrelated things such as the possession of firearms near school zones. This bill has been brought before this Commerce Committee, I assume because it's an issue of commerce. You're trying to prohibit New Hampshire citizens from buying and trading guns between New Hampshire citizens. Virtually every proponent of this bill that I've heard here speak today admitted that this bill will not prevent violence. So why are you going to burden us with this bill? If it's not going to prevent violence, gun violence, then why bring up a bill to make you feel good? That you did something? You didn't do anything. Don't fool yourselves. Now I'm going to address a specific statute in this bill that is of concern to me personally. If you have a copy of the bill, you can follow along with me. If I can find it. It is on page four. It begins with line four. Section 159E3, exemptions. This chapter shall not apply to, and it goes on the list, I don't know, eight different things, I guess, they're Roman numeralized. The first one, number one, Roman number one says, a transfer between immediate family members which shall be limited to spouses, parents, children, grandparents, grandchildren, and siblings that is a loan or a bona fide gift. I don't have any children. I don't have any spouses. When I die, what are you going to do with my guns? I want to give them to, to an organization. You're going to prevent that? With this bill? It's a violation of my personal rights. Frank D'Amico made reference. He's a gun owner. I trade and buy from him. He can make a fortune on these transfers to uh, licensed gun dealers. Presently, they get anywhere from $25 to $40 a gun per transfer. For example, let's do some math. I was a math science teacher. If you have 100 guns, which I do, that's $4,000. You're going to burden me with a $4,000 transfer fee? That's outrageous. Never. I'll sell them on the black market first. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony, sir. You're welcome. Got to go. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, Representative uh, Com uh, Copeland has uh, come in uh, and uh, would like to speak. Representative Copeland. Yeah, Sorry, I didn't see you. Sorry to move fast enough. Uh, Tim Copeland, State Representative, Rockingham County District 19, Stratton, New Hampshire. I'm here to speak against the bill, um, primarily the area of private sales. And I have more questions than answers for the committee to look at and review before you come to a determination in your executive level. The Tenth Amendment is important because, as some people already brought up, if I'm licensed to carry a gun, and I'm giving you an example, and I'm on school property, and somebody sees my gun, and I'm not supposed to have it because there's a federal law that says within a thousand feet of a school zone, it's protected. But let's say I'm there. Let's say the local police are called, and they come to investigate. They have no authority to take my gun or arrest me. All they can do is gather and glean my information and pass that on to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, who are the only entity, federal entity, allowed to place me under arrest if they deem, after their investigation, that there's enough to do that. More importantly, though, and there's gun dealers here that can speak for this, I'm surprised it hasn't come up. The paperwork involved, the federal forms, if you're a private citizen, you have to do two things. I would have to turn over a federal form to have you fill out, and it better be filled out properly, because ATF wants it all filled out properly, or they're gonna reject it, and then you have to reach out to that person that you sold the gun to, and correct the paperwork, and hold on to it. I believe licensed dealers have to hold on to that paperwork for 20 years. Are you as a private citizen gonna hold on to that paperwork for 20 years? I don't know, these are all questions I'm asking that need to be addressed. And I know there's gun dealers here that can do that. But they need to be asked. How are we going to supersede federal law? If we enact state legislation, who's going to enforce it? You can't make alcohol, tobacco, and firearms enforce it. They're only going to enforce their regulations. You can't have the New Hampshire State Police enforcing something like that. And then just the name check alone. How are they going to get the phone number? How are they going to know how to do it? There's only one person in the state police that's actually doing it. And doing it on a weekend can take hours and hours and hours. I'm just asking you to think about these things before you move on. Have those questions answered by other people here who are better to answer them than I am. I'm just, I'm just bringing up the questions to think about. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we will uh, take those questions into consideration. Representative Burt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. And committee members. I stand before you 100% opposed to HB 1589, and I'm going to tell you why. Any death from a firearm is tragic, and I feel sorry for any of them. But how many firearms are used to save lives? A lot more than it is to take them. And there's a little bit of talk about children and, you know, we want to save the children and everything, and the schools. I think you know where I'm from. I'm from the old Vermont. We had firearms in our schools. I used to bring my 22 to school because after there was a big gravel pit out on the side and we'd go shoot there. That's what the boys did. Now the rule of thumb was we put the gun in the bottom locker, because we had two locker tier, and we put the bullets in the top. That's what the principal asked. He says, please don't bring loaded guns into the school. So we tried to make sure they were unloaded, but still, we had guns in school. And you know what? Nothing happened. Everything was fine. What I say 
is arm willing and trained teachers that want to protect our children. That is how we're going to get rid of this problem. Currently, there's 97 deaths by automobiles. There's 1,700 deaths to, of cancer every day in this country. Every day. We aren't talking about those. The problem I'm having with this bill, too, is that I do want to give my grandchildren my guns, and I guess there is a, a, poly, a part in here that's going to allow that. But what's going to stop this bill from coming back, taking one more thing, one more thing, just like they did in Australia and England, and guess what? They're disarmed down there. Totally. And that don't work very well with citizens in a tyrannical government. Also, I went to Representative Houle's house one time and I picked up a bunch of with my wife's car. So here I am in my wife's car. I packed that trunk full of firearms with mine and some of his I borrowed. And I went to Representative Baldessaro's wedding. Because at the end they were going to take a picture with all the beautiful women all dressed up fancy. And of course the gun, the anti-gunners have used that picture negatively unfortunately. But this bill would make me a felon if I did that. And I don't see any harm in me taking a gun from one spot down to another spot. But this bill has a problem. And also, this is against the Constitution because it has downshifting, which is against our Constitution. There's a part in here that says there's a... $756.25 flat fee per felon. And if I become one of those felons because I borrow somebody's gun and go to the range, you know, that's what it's going to cost the taxpayers. And then it also says in here that to house me, and I guess to feed me, is going to be $32,872. That's downshift into the counties. And if I understand the Constitution right, we're not allowed to do that. And finally, to wrap up, Section C, Part 1, I believe, of the bill, I just want to read the first part of it. It says, background checks are an effective and easy mechanism to ensure that guns are not purchased by or transferred to those who are prohibited from possessing them. Has anybody ever used this in D.C., Detroit, or Chicago? Because I'm sure they have this bill. And it isn't working very well out there for them. So I ask the committee, please, ITL this and send the message, leave New Hampshire alone. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Burt. Thank you. No. No questions. Is Ms. Grote still here? Janet? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Janet Grote. Uh, I live in Portsmouth. And I'm here um, as a mother of two children. And I'm also active in our new uh, New Hampshire chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. Um, a lot has been said today uh, by those who oppose this bill. Um, I'm here because I strongly support it. As we think about what's happening and the concerns that have been raised today, I ask you members of the committee to just think about common sense. There's not been a lot of research done on gun violence because for most of the recent years, the federal government has been prohibited prohibited from gathering statistics about gun violence. So we don't have a big database to draw from. You're going to have to use your common sense. Uh, our organization was formed in the wake of the tragic killings in Newtown, Connecticut, which happened uh, a little bit more than a year ago. Since that time, there have been 34 school shootings, school and university shootings in our country. 
Uh, and sadly, you may not know, there was one today. I just got word on my cell phone of a shooting at Purdue University where uh, one person, I believe, is dead. The suspect is in custody and thankfully was apprehended. Um, but as moms, we live this fear every day for our kids. We look for a wide range of solutions. We know that the bill before you isn't going to be the golden solution that solves the big problem, but it's a piece of a solution. And um, while we certainly know, and it's been talked about today, that there's a huge black market uh, for, for acquiring guns, what we're asking you to do is shrink the size of that black market. Make it smaller. Use your common sense to say, here, we're going to require these background checks where we can. And for the criminal who is dead bent on causing harm, he or she will probably still be able to do so. But for the person who has had a temporary downslide and wants to possess a weapon to hurt himself or to hurt someone else in the midst of a passion that has overcome him, that person will have to look harder and try harder to get a firearm. So that's where I see this having some impact. So please, um, we ask you to listen to all the arguments, but think about all of, uh, all of those of us who support it, who could not be here today, and we hope to continue this conversation with you. Thank you. Representative Sandler has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming. Uh, one of the things that you said was that uh, 1589 is just a piece of the overall solution. I was wondering if you could go into what the other pieces of the solution are as far as you see them. Um, I'm going to answer your question as an individual and not as a representative of an organization because I think it's sort of easier for me to do that. Uh, but like the people from Sandy Hook who spoke earlier, I think we're looking at a number of laws that will make it um, harder for guns to fall into the wrong hands, this being one of them. We're also looking at expanding mental health services uh, to people in need and uh, reducing access, access, excuse me, uh, making it harder for children to access guns um, when accidentally left in the home. And there are many, many ways that we have to approach the problem. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The next three people we will hear from are David Nar Narby, uh, Frederick Barron, and Rick Olson. Mr. Narby, and uh, if you could make it about three or four minutes, that would be This great. won't take long. Thank you, Representative Bob Butler, uh, esteemed ladies and gentlemen of the committee. I wish I'd known that it was so easy to access you. I would have worn my sport coat. I'll rectify that next time. Um, most people here have addressed most of my issues. Uh, one thing that I would like to address the primary sponsor of the bill, Ms. Elaine Andrews Ahern. Uh, she asked a question during her testimony. She said that what could be the harm of this bill? I would like to address that. This bill has already been pointed out as de facto registration through the federal government via the ATF, which has proven itself arguably to be a lawless and rogue federal agency. Every instance in history, gun registration has led to confiscation. And every state-sponsored genocide has been preceded by a confiscation. Now, you're all familiar with the saying, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. The fact that this is even being considered right now, right here, it doesn't quite walk like one, but it really sounds like one. Do you have any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Seeing no questions. Frederick Barron from Exeter. Good afternoon. Thank you very much to the committee and to our chair um, <clears throat> for holding this committee, holding this hearing, and uh, uh, your attention to this important issue. Um, I am a retired pediatrician living in Exeter. I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, whose position on firearms my remarks will will reflect. Um, I'm speaking in, in favor of House Bill 1589, which, as you know, requires background checks for all firearm sales. 
As you all probably know, medicine is a discipline which is designed to help, not harm people. Nevertheless, there's need for state regulation of the practice and commerce of medicine. Most would agree that the risks of harm in the practice of medicine are outweighed by its benefits, but still, there is a need for regulation, regulation of many aspects of the commerce of, of medical practice. It's regulated because it is in the best interest of the state to be sure that the public health is protected. Firearms are also a public health issue. Firearms are used for many different purposes, some of which, as we've heard, are a benefit to the public, such as the, in the realm of public safety. But there is also a public health risk when firearms are in the hands of individuals who are not able to appropriately use, store, and handle firearms. You have seen all the annual statistics which reflect the destruction which unfettered access to firearms has brought to the young people of this country. On the order of uh, <clears throat> 1,250 deaths every year to young people and children, 11,570 some injuries every year, and 720 suicides because of the availability of, of firearms. As a pediatrician, I have seen how these weapons can destroy healthy children, not only in taking their lives away from them, as we witnessed in Sandy Hook, but also how the wanton use of firearms in neighborhoods strikes fear into the children in those neighborhoods, in our homes, in our schools, who want to call those places secure and safe. By bringing a degree of firearms regulation to New Hampshire, we're taking one of many steps, the many steps that we've, we've talked about, to reduce the tragedy of these lost lives. But we are also demonstrating to our children that their fear of these weapons is being recognized. And the state wants our children to feel more secure in their homes, and in their schools. And to that extent, as Representative Baldessaro said, yes, this does have a feel-good part to it. But there's nothing wrong with that feel-good part to it. Our children need that. As consumers of service and products, we deserve to know that our public health is being protected. As legislators, it's your job to carry out your mission to ensure that the commerce of services and products, including firearms, protects the public health. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. I think we've heard, and I've seen in the statistics, that New Hampshire is currently the 48th safest state. We are only three from the best as far as the safety here in the state of New Hampshire. I'm sure that the statistics that you gave are national statistics and not intended to be construed to be only here in New Hampshire. If we are already right near the, the, the most safe, the safest communities in the, in, the, in the country, and we have repeatedly been ranked as the safest and best places to live, what is to be gained by something that doesn't accomplish anything uh, and is, is, by your own admission, a piece of feel-good legislation? It's not only a piece of feel-good legislation. It takes some very specific actions. But in regard to um, this being one of the safest states in the country, I'm proud to be in New Hampshire. I'm proud to be on the board of, uh, of directors of the Children's Trust, which works to keep uh, children from being abused and neglected. Um, yes, there's a lot to be proud of, but I think that the other side of it is, as we heard from, our, our, um, from the people in, in Sandy Hook, 
They didn't expect it was going to happen to them. Sandy Hook was not inner city, which is what others have referred to, um, Washington, Detroit, and so forth. Sandy Hook was like Exeter, New Hampshire. It was like Concord. You know, it could happen anywhere. And this is just one more step to make our children feel more secure and also to provide a modicum of, of protection for them. Representative Hammond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. Uh, I would assume that you and your organization would have information about studies that would have been done on uh, school populations or communities or whatever of the children and families that not necessarily killed or wounded by gun violence, but the, the collateral psychological damage. Absolutely. And if you have those kinds of studies, can you provide that information to the committee? I, was, <clears throat> I will try and get them for you and, uh, and distribute them to the entire committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Rick Olson from Londonderry, representing the Londonderry Fish and Game. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is Rick Olson. President of the London Area Vision Game Club. Um, our club consists of 1,300 members and is arguably one of the largest clubs in southern New Hampshire. And our club encompasses a broad array of constituencies within the firearm and shooting sports genre, uh, if you will. Uh, you know, I, I read this bill and I was reading the legislative findings. And one of the observations I made, I've read a lot of literature and a lot of materials provided by the Mayors Against Illegal Guns, Michael Bloomberg, that whole crowd, and uh, all the verbiage in the legislative findings come right out of their chapter and verse, okay? Why is that important? I'll tell you why it's important. They brought a bus down here last year, okay? And when we want to talk about credibility, probative value, or whether or not somebody can be believed. They brought a bus, they parked it out here, and they read a list of names. They called it the No More Names Tour. And guess whose name was on that list? Tamerlan Tsarnaev, the Boston bomber, killed by a gun. And they named criminals. They named people that shot at police officers. Okay? So if you want to know whether there's any credibility in the legislative findings, you need only look to where they came from and consider their source. That's the first thing that made me suspect about this bill, okay? I oppose this bill on the very grounds that this is unnecessary, it's frivolous, and it's another example of incrementalism. Okay, this is incrementally taking away our gun rights. Oh, sure, you know, you talk to everybody in here, you know, there's, you're not gonna talk to one person that doesn't wanna keep our children and our families and our community safe from maniacs that shot up uh, Newtown, Connecticut. Let's understand the, the, the context of where that came from. When all those children died in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, the Brady campaign rated that state as having some of the most stringent gun laws in the United States. That's prior to the shooting, okay? And then after the shooting, they went and enacted more stringent regulations. They have gun registration in Connecticut now. So I ask you, passing this piece of legislation, is it really going to solve a problem or is this a solution in search of a problem? Finally, there's things hidden in here that the bill, that this bit, that, that the whole scheme of it does not contemplate. For example, okay, it de basically creates a de facto ban of shooting on private property. Now that sounds wacky, let me explain. Okay, if we look at page four, line three, or line two, it gives us specific exceptions. This chapter shall not apply to. And then if we jump down, we, you know, we see uh, law enforcement or corrections agencies, we see marshals, we see federally licensed gunsmith who receives a firearm, common carrier, warehouse, or persons engaged in the business of transportation, or storage to the extent that, okay, yada, yada, yada. A person who acquired the firearm by operation of law, the temporary transfer of a firearm between spouses. Okay, but, and then we go down to line 23. Uh, 
as long as immediately necessary, three, that occurs at an established shooting range authorized by the government body of a jurisdiction in which such range is located. The governing body of that jurisdiction in which such range is located. So, <clears throat> I invite my pals over to my 100 acre parcel. We want to shoot a few guns. We can do so safely. We have the appropriate berms or whatever. It's on my personal private property. I invite my pals over. This law's in place. I hand a gun over to my pal and I say, yeah, give a go. See if you can hit the target. The lady across the street calls the police because her cats are getting scared. And the police come down and they say, hey, you know, what's happening here? You know, where are all these guns? Who owns these guns? And here's my pal holding a gun. He says, oh, he owns it. Guess what? That under this bill, that's a transfer of the firearm unlawfully because that property, according to this law, is not an authorized or sanctioned shooting range. So this comes in the back door to say, you can't shoot your guns on your own private property. And somebody will get jammed up and they'll say, oh, we need a piece of legislation to clarify that. Don't pass it, make it inexpedient to legislate. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Jones. Thank you for coming. Um, I first, my first question is, um, you were talking about the legislative findings at the beginning of the bill. Are you pretty much saying that, generally speaking, those are incorrect or exaggerated? There's several of them that are incorrect. For example, on the first page, and I, I didn't want to you know, restate what somebody else has already said. For example, in the first page of the legislative findings, I got the one written on two sides here, it says, in fact, it has been estimated that 40% of all firearms are sold in the United States by unlicensed people. That statistic is nearly 20 years old and consists of a uh, sampling of about 300 people. Okay, and bear in mind, that statistic contemplates law prior to the National Instant Check System. So that's, that's basically a lie. But yet further down, it says here, background checks are an effective and easy mechanism to ensure that guns are not purchased or transferred by those prohibited from possessing them. Since 1998, NICS, background checks have blocked over two million gun sales. We heard Ralph D'Amico talk about, you know, how people get jammed up in that. You know, we've heard all kinds of lies. We heard one representative come up here and talk about, you know, buying uh, firearms on the internet without a license, okay? That's not the case. If I, I, I've purchased guns on the internet myself. And the way I did that was I made contact, I was a successful bidder. I then had to go to Ralph D'Amico and say, hey Ralph, can you, ink, can you send an inked FFL to this guy down in Georgia? And he'll send you the firearm and then Ralph, I pay him a transfer fee and I do my 4473 and I get to take possession of the firearm. It goes from dealer to dealer. It's a lie. They're telling lies. Gun show loophole doesn't exist here. You go to a gun show and buy a firearm, you fill out a 4473. That's a fact. Sir, we have another question for you, Representative Sandblay. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned that Connecticut already had stringent uh, regulations at the time that Sandy Hook occurred. That's correct. And what I'm wondering is, are the requirements in this bill similar to what existed in Connecticut before uh, that situation? That I couldn't honestly say for sure. Um, I, I know Connecticut, in terms of uh, what they call assault weapons, that you know, semi-automatic firearms, they only really call assault weapons. Uh, they had regulations pertaining to those. They had regulations pertaining to the requirements of carrying the firearms. They had a regulation regarding the storage and care and keeping of firearms so that unauthorized or inappropriate persons couldn't get their hands on them. But I don't know what the specifics would be on that. Representative Rice, is this a new question? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you referred to some of the exceptions uh, that are listed in this bill. Uh, on page four, on line 19, uh, exception number six, 
It says a person who acquired the firearm by operation of law upon the death of the former owner of the firearm. So if somebody died and in their will they left a particular firearm to another individual that automatically excludes them from needing a background check. What would happen if the person who received that weapon was in fact mentally incompetent or to, to do this? A crime could still happen and this person would be an exception to it. That's a loophole, is it not? I, I don't know what's contemplated or meant by operation of law. Well, it, 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 I just read it to you. A person who acquired the firearm by operation of law upon the death of a former owner of the firearm. So if they willed it to somebody, right, and that person they willed it to was not mentally competent, they could commit a crime. It would be known about in advance, but there's nothing to stop that person from acquiring a firearm. So isn't that, in fact, the type of loophole? That that's indeed would be a loophole if that scenario played out, wouldn't it? It would. Thank you, and thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Although I said 3.30 a break, I want to do two more uh, people, and uh, uh, then we will take a short break. Um, Anne Lysak uh, from Portsmouth. Thank you for coming. Chairman Butler and committee members, I'm Ann Lysak from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I am a mother, a grandmother, a teacher, and also a victim of gun violence. My husband was shot in a 1994 drive-by shooting in Portsmouth. I'm here today to support this bill. Last October, I was in a kindergarten classroom during a lockdown drill. I sat with 15 small children as we waited very quietly while the police went through the building. It was a drill. Also in my school, teachers have to carry two keys every day, one key for the front entry and one key for our classroom. Now isn't it sad that we've come to this? Times were much better when, we, when the teachers did not have to do this. Life was better not too long ago, but now we have a, an epidemic of violence. We all know there's over 30,000 gun deaths every year. And many, maybe that's just a number to you. Maybe you think shootings are happening in other states and we're quite safe here. So let's talk about New Hampshire. Just a few headlines for you from WMUR website. Starting in September 20th, or sorry, September 30th. Former student in custody after lockdown at Kingston School. 18 year old threatened several people with a gun in the parking lot. October 1st, residents of a Dover neighborhood where a deadly standoff took place Tuesday said that it sounded like a war zone. November 24th, a Manchester shooting leaves one dead, another in critical condition. October 22nd, a Dover man who beat a woman with a hammer exchanged gunfire with police before shooting himself. December 3rd, a Manchester man is facing charges after police said he pulled out a gun during an argument over a parking place. In my written testimony that I submitted, I have for you three pages of gun incidents recorded by WMUR <coughs> right here in New Hampshire. Now, none of these were national news, but many of them had the potential, the possibility of becoming national news. We were just lucky they did not. Do you want to do nothing about this epidemic? This epidemic of violence? Here's your chance to do something, voting for this bill. We might never know if there's any 
good result to the bill, but it certainly does have that potential, that possibility. If a gun death happened in your family, you would be here supporting the bill. Don't wait for that to happen. It's really a very simple issue here today. Where are your values? Do you value gun rights or public safety? Do you value gun rights or human life? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. And uh, before we take a break, Dan Hines from National. Thank you. I'm attorney Dan Hines, a proud gun owner, and I oppose this bill. I suggest that some people who are in favor of this bill might not actually have read the bill. It's called an act requiring background checks for all firearm sales. That's misleading, and it's really a lie. This is an act requiring background checks for all firearm possessions. As was stated earlier, if I go to my friend's house, and they're a lawful gun owner, they own a gun, I'm a lawful gun owner, I own a gun, we're shooting on their property, he wants to say, hey, I like that gun, maybe I want to buy that, let me shoot it. I hand him that gun, I'm now a felon if this bill passes. As a responsible gun owner, we would want people to target practice. This bill prevents law-abiding citizens from possessing a gun without getting a background check. Now, I guess I'm going to say to my friend, well, wait, I, before I give you this gun, let's go get a background check for you, even though I know you have guns. And the way I was reading the bill is the background check is really for a person buying a gun, so I guess I have to pay a transfer fee and have the person pass the background check just to, fight, just to shoot my firearm on his property where I know he is lawfully able to do so. Does that sound like common sense? That sounds pretty asinine. People have suggested that what's the worst thing that could happen? I, could suggest, I suggest to you that innocent people could really be hurt if this bill passes. If someone is a victim of domestic violence, and let's say it's six o'clock on a Sunday night, and someone, their partner says to them, I'm gonna kill you. And she says, she um, goes to her neighbor and says, whoa, my, my um, intimate partner, he just threatened to kill me. The neighbor says, we'll call the cops. She calls the cops. Is the cops gonna stay outside of her place all day? Or the neighbor who owns a firearm could say, let me be safe for the night. Here, take this firearm until you can get to court Monday, get that restraining order. This bill would have unintended consequences. And what harm could it have? Innocent people could be killed. And what else it can do is turn felons into law-abiding citizens. I suggest it greatly infringes on the right to possess firearms and will not do what people want it to do, which is keep people, keep people safe. If we want to keep, keep people safer, we need to address mental health issues. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no questions, we'll take a break for ideally no more than six minutes so we can start again at quarter up. Um, we have at least another 20 people to testify. I'd like to take testimony from these uh, three people, Melissa Ragazio, Eileen Landis, and Matthew Murphy. Um, is Ms. Ragazio still here? Um, if anybody knows her and she's still here, then uh, let her know that we want to hear from her. Uh, Eileen Landis. Thank you, Chairman Butler and Commerce Committee for the opportunity to speak here on behalf of the NHLA, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. I am the current chair of the organization of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. And many of the issues that I wanted to bring up today have already been spoken about, and I won't take the committee's time. But one of the things that hasn't been really touched upon enough is it's a property rights issue. Um, there, I don't have um, an ability to um, allow me to sale or transfer, transfer my property to another individual personally. So if I wanted to get rid of my washing machine, I don't have to register to get rid of a washing machine or my power tools. If I wanted to go ahead and sell them to a neighbor's son who's just learned how to use power tools, there's no issue with that. And 
With the gun, there is. Now you say, well, how does this relate to anything? Well, the question is, is back in 2013, CBS um, gave an FBI report that there were more murders committed with hammers and clubs than rifles or shotguns. So if you look at that information, we should be registering the sale of hammers and clubs. Should we not? So that also extends to knives. So if I want to give somebody a set of knives for a wedding present, do I need to go to a registered dealer to give them wives knives for a wedding present? It, it, it's just it continues down a slippery slope from a property rights standpoint. On another note, I'm a member of Second Amendment Sisters, which is a group of women who believe very strongly in the Second Amendment. And there's a monthly all-female shoot. And we typically do have it at a gun club, but members do have properties that are safe to be able to share firearms. And the specialness about Second Amendment Sisters and the all-female shoots is one, it's not intimidating for women who've never been around guns, who've never held a gun, who've never shot. It's that 75-year-old widow who finds herself in her home at night hearing every creak and not knowing, wow, I have no way to protect myself. Maybe I should consider a firearm. But where do I go? How do I know what to buy? How do I know what feels good? How should it fit in my hand? So providing them the opportunity to come to one of our shoots and try somebody else's gun to see how it feels. Can I, can I handle a 22? Or maybe I want that 357. What, what, what are they looking for? What will defend them? What can they actually shoot? And so this gives them an opportunity to try weapons. But it would be a felony for me to allow somebody else to try any of my guns under this piece of legislation. That's the issue. There's multiple issues to this piece of legislation. It's a property rights issue. It's seven years of felony for, for um, every day or every opportunity of the offense. So what if I bring five firearms? How, how, how much jail time would I do then if I shared five of my firearms with Second Amendment Sisters? So that a woman could have an opportunity to try a firearm to be able to protect herself in her home. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't consider doing anything other than that. So I, I guess there's multiple faults in this piece of legislation, and I'm hoping that you will choose to ITI. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, uh, Mr. Matthew Murphy from Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. I'm here to testify on behalf of Citizens for Strong New Hampshire in opposition to House Bill 1589. Our organization and its members are firm believers in the principles of limited government laid out by our founding fathers in the United States Constitution and reaffirmed within our own state constitution. We believe that this legislation is a direct threat to the Second Amendment right of citizens to keep and bear arms and passage of this legislation will infringe on these rights. Background checks have no impact towards preventing violent crime. In states where background checks and gun laws are very strict, murder and violent crime rates vary widely. For example, New York, which has the four strictest gun laws in America, was in the top 10 for murder rates in the nation in the year 2011. We, uh, in Chicago, which has perhaps the strictest gun laws in America, has one of the highest murder rates. Chicago is 90th out of 90 cities in the level of enforcement of our federal gun laws. The worst of the worst. We strongly believe that this legislation will not have any effect on criminal activity or violent crime and will only hurt law-abiding gun owners. It is already a federal felony for any private person to sell, trade, give, lend, rent, or transfer a gun to a person you know or should have known is not legally allowed to own, purchase, or possess a firearm. The penalty for selling a gun to a person who is a criminal, mentally ill, mentally incompetent, an alcohol abuser, or drug abuser is a 10-year federal felony. That's now, today, with no changes to the law. According to a 2012 report by the Department of Justice, more than 72,000 people were turned down on a gun purchase 
in 2010 because they didn't pass the background check. Yet only 44 of those cases were prosecuted. 44 out of 72,000. Citizens for a Strong New Hampshire encourages that we vigorously enforce our current federal laws that makes it a crime to falsify information on background check applications and for strong straw purchases. We believe that this would have a greater effect in preventing the purchase of firearms by a criminal. This proposed legislation will not accomplish any of the goals set out by its sponsors. Thank you for your time. And I have copies of that testimony. Thank you. If you would bring your copies down, we'll make sure that everyone gets one. Thank you very much. Did Ms. Ragazio come back or is she gone? She's gone. Okay. Um, Kirk McNeil, uh, Charlene Seibel, and Dr. Michael Lale um, will be the next three to testify. Mr. McNeil? Yes, indeed. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. It always interests me when I come to a hearing what it is that people seem to say at the beginning to establish their authenticity or expert status. So I suppose I should start off by saying that I've been shot in 1991, but that doesn't make me an expert. It makes me both lucky to still be standing here and a little stupid for getting into that situation to begin with. Uh, I think that it's important to look at a couple things about the language of the law before we start talking about the intent or anything like that. Many of these have been brought up already, so I won't reiterate those, but one of the things that hasn't been brought up already is that under New Hampshire law, it is unconstitutional to create a privileged class. However, in this law, or in this proposed bill, I should say, the exemption of law enforcement officers creates a privileged class. Therefore, if you're going to pass this bill into law, you've got to take that part out. Um, it also interests me that, as has been previously stated, most of what's in this bill is boilerplate from anti-gun campaigns that are nationwide. We've heard the slippery slope argument brought up before in a derogatory fashion that that's a slippery slope argument. However, there's enough data if we look not just around the nation, but if we look to countries like England, that increasing gun laws and restricting law-abiding citizens from owning and possessing firearms, transferring their own personal property, does not lead to less violence. Now in England, they're to the point of making it a felony for people to possess knives. Not quite sure where that's gotten them, except now the cops who used to only carry billy clubs have to carry submachine guns. It is a slippery slope, and it's not a good one. And it's not derogatory to say that's a slippery slope when you've just watched several states and whole other countries slide down the slope to no good end. I was encouraged, or thought I was going to be encouraged, many times over to have people say, it's just common sense, it's just common sense. But apparently common sense is not particularly common. I think that this bill suffers from a phenomenon of, we have to do something! But a lot of times the something that we try to do is actually worse than not doing anything. In this particular instance, we've been asked to discover and discuss all reasonable options. We talked earlier, or I mentioned earlier, about how it's wrong to create a privileged class under New Hampshire law. And so what I want to say is, without getting into too much detail and belaboring the point, I know we've been here a long time today, that one of those reasonable options would be look at the situation, look at the school shootings and mall shootings, that have occurred, that are pointed to so often when we're asked to consider gun legislation and realize that every single one of them happened in a gun-free zone. And that far from creating a privileged class, our teachers and educators today are deprived of their Second Amendment rights, which makes them second-class citizens, which is also unconstitutional. I think that the common sense solution is for us not to create a privileged class and not to allow to, for people to be created as second class citizens. 
but to give everybody their natural rights to life and to the right to defend their own lives. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Uh, seeing no questions. Charlene Seibel, or Seibel, I don't know how you say your last name. Thank you, you did very well at Seibel. And I'd like to thank you for the chance to testify, and I'd also like to thank all the committee members for their service to the citizens of New Hampshire. My name is Charlene Seibel, I'm from Wolf Road, New Hampshire, and I'm a gun owner. I'm here in uh, support of HB 1589, and I'll be brief. I'm saddened and, yes, even outraged that there are no Republican, Independent, or Libertarian co-sponsors of this bill, according to my understanding. The need for common sense gun reform should transcend party lines. It is a need in every city and state of this country, not only San Francisco. I deeply resent the characterization of this bill by the National Rifle Association Institute for Legislative Action as an egregious anti-gun bill. I deeply resent the New Hampshire Tea Party Coalition statement that, quote, HB 1589 is sponsored by some of the most anti-Second Amendment anti-freedom ideologues in New Hampshire, unquote. Why are law-abiding gun owners so afraid of universal background checks? Is it the National Gun Registry boogeyman? Background checks have been shown to reduce weapons in the hands of restricted persons, which, by the way, already has set aside a special class of people who cannot own guns. No one's coming to take our guns. If the feds identify you as a threat, they won't need to take your guns to neutralize you. I'm sick and tired of this tyranny of the minority. Nationally and in New Hampshire, those who oppose universal background checks are in the minority, even among Republicans and NRA member households. By the way, States with weak gun laws are prime targets for restricted people to access guns, which is one of the reasons why so many places where you see high crime, even though there's stringent gun laws in place, the criminals go over the borders to get their guns. It's time for our elected representatives to shake their fear of perhaps the largest gun manufacturer's lobby in this country, the National Rifle Association, and the American Legislative Exchange Council. It's time for you to respect the over 80% of New Hampshire citizens in multiple polls who support universal background checks. The time to throw our hands in the air with our heads in the sand is over. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Doctor, is it Leon? Yes. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm wasting my time today. I've heard people talking about the children. I canceled an appointment today. I've worked in biomedical research for 25 years, all of my adult life. I was going to talk about acute lymphocytic leukemia today, research. I canceled that to come here. Maybe that doesn't count. Um, I know earlier this year, the head of New Hampshire Fish and Game was entirely ignored. Separate committee, but when it got to the full house, his recommendation that a bill be tabled, absolutely ignored. When I went to Dartmouth Medical School, a mentor and friend of mine, C. Everett Coop, has been ignored by the same body, bigger body here, when he said the only thing more addictive than nicotine is tax spending taxes from tobacco. Along those lines, I'd like to make a few corrections on here, starting with this. This is my credit card. Someone came up here and said there's an internet loophole and a gun show loophole. Anybody wants to take this and order a gun off the internet or go to a gun show, go to a dealer there, you can purchase a gun with this, Put $10,000 on the table, I'll do it too. I don't see anybody coming to take it. I've taken this, I've talked with our federal representative, my federal representative, Carol Shea Porter, she won't take me up on the offer. The loopholes simply do not exist. That is not truth. We should seek the truth here. Along those lines, I'm his father. Unfortunately, my wife isn't able to be here. I have a 15 month old son. Before he's 18 months, he's going to have a little brother. The last thing I want is for my kids to be in any type of harm, whether it's from guns or anything else. I don't care where the violence comes from. I don't want violence from my 
kids. It's not what they're going to learn. Um, I'll be brief on the rest of this. There's a lot of stuff that was said here. Um, this was, somebody said boilerplate. This has literally been almost plagiarized from the Mayors Against Illegal Gun website. The mayor of Nashua had to step down from that committee. The mayor of Dover, who was a member of that, got run out of town. Um, the IACP and MAG have the same goals, as well as Representative Ahern on her Vote Smart webpage directly said her goal is to disarm every citizen and confiscate guns. That's right out of their mouths. That's not mine. Um, oh, I have to say, this is really a new love. When I was a kid, people used to talk about taking one stone and killing two birds. This is one bill that's going to kill two constitutions. And the purpose of both the U.S. Constitution and the New Hampshire State Constitution, which predates the U.S. Constitution, is to limit the government. It's not to limit the people. It's to limit the government. So don't think about limiting us. Um, I'm going to be brief and just kind of skip through this. Um, somebody in here has repeated this absolutely hilarious study of 96% of New Hampshire gun owners want background checks. I urge the committee, please, the United States is number 55 right now on science and math out of the whole world. We are circling the porcelain, you know what, we are horrible. This study was done by a professor right here in New Hampshire of his own students who still needed to get a grade from him. If you don't think that's biased, tell me what is. You can't have a more biased study than that. It's just absolutely crazy. Um, I, I urge you to do, actually do fact checking on some of these absurd claims that are made on here. Um, going back to my son, when he turns 16, I cannot wait for the day when he's able to buy his own hunting license. He'll know how to before there's ex exemptions in here. I can certainly hand him my gun ahead of that. When he turns 16, what if he wants to use a friend's gun? That's certainly illegal right now. That's certainly something I did. He'd be a criminal. At 16, you're going to make a criminal out of a 16-year-old who I intend to raise to be a gentleman and a scholar. Oh, so Can you wrap up your comments, please? I will be done in a minute. Um, I, I will be done as briefly as possible. Um, the other thing, I urge you to please look at the definition of the weapon that's in this bill and think of an airbag in a car. I really don't want to have to go through background checks to go buy a car. That would really be ridiculous. Read the bill, please. Um, Sir, don't assume that uh, the uh, representatives in the Congress... I'm aware that some are very much opposed to this. Read the bill. Thank you. And I apologize if that was taken the wrong way. It was not intended so. Um, oh. I'm getting through this. All right. So, last thing. Um, we had two people from out of state testify here for Sandy Hook. It's absolutely a tragedy what happened. Nobody wants that to happen here. It is absolutely a tragedy. But it was her parents' politics that created the gun free zone to enable that tragedy. And we don't need the politics here in New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Dina Romero, are you still here? Great. Can you hear me all right? Um, the item in my hand. The item in my hand comes from Germany and it's called a surprise egg because the hollow chocolate shell contains now I'm looking at the other part it contains a plastic container and the plastic container has a small toy in it this egg is not sold in this country for fear that young children might small swallow the small parts of the surprise. The internet tells me I could be subject to a $2,500 fine for bringing the surprise egg into this country. We regulate the, sell, the sale of this chocolate egg, but we hesitate to regulate the sale of firearms. HB 1589 defines a firearm as a weapon and the dictionary defines a weapon 
as a thing designed to inflict bodily harm or physical damage. If we truly care about the safety of our children, we need to ensure that the marketplace does not allow items which inflict bodily harm to be sold to criminals, domestic violence abusers, and the dangerously mentally ill. HB 1589 provide, provides a much needed balance between the Second Amendment rights of those who wish to purchase a gun and the rights of the public to be safe from those who should not own a gun. Law-abiding citizens register their cars and have them inspected. They take off their shoes and stand on line at airports while their luggage and clothing are screened. Why wouldn't a law-abiding gun owner want his and her fellow gun owners to submit to a background check in the interest of protecting their own safety and that of others? According to the 2013 show and poll, 89% of New Hampshire citizens support background checks before every gun sale. The medical profession calls gun violence a public health issue. Sure, universal background checks might not have prevented what happened at the Sandy Hook School in Newtown. But in the interest of public safety, shouldn't we do whatever we legally can to address a public health issue? We did that with seat belts smoking, and we're now talking, according to my local newspaper, about limiting texting and cell phone use while driving, all in the interest of public safety. In states with required background checks, there are fewer women killed by domestic partners, fewer law enforcement officers killed by handguns that were not their own, fewer crime guns exported to other states, and a lower firearm suicide rate. If the chocolate egg is not meant for the hands of small children, why wouldn't we ensure that lethal weapons don't get into the hands of people who don't respect the law? I have sat here and listened to lots of testimony, and I am very tired of people making this a pro-gun, anti-gun debate. We have a Second Amendment that's not going away. I am not fighting with the Second Amendment. I am not fighting with anybody's legal right to own a gun as long as they're not a domestic abuser or a felon or a dangerously mentally ill. But I, as a member of the public, also have a right and I would like to feel safe. We need to try to do something about the problem of gun violence in our country and in our state. If Congress won't pass universal background checks, then the states have to step up to the plate. As a mother and a grandmother, and as a New Hampshire native who has lived most of her entire life in this state, I respectfully urge you to support HB 1589. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for giving us a copy of your written testimony. Uh, we'll take uh, four people next. Uh, I think this is Adam Muger, but uh, you have a doctor's handwriting even if you're not a doctor. And uh, Steve Weinberg, Nathan Grazer, Grazer? and Michelle Lavelle. Are you Mr. Mooker? No. Adam, uh, where, where is that person from? Uh, where from Hillsborough. From Hillsborough? Uh, apparently he could not stay. Uh, Stephen Weinberger, Weinberg from Exeter is also not here. Nathan Grazer. Grazer? Glazer, sorry. Hello, many members. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Nathan Glazer. I just want to um, put a point 
that um, some background. I am from Colorado. Kind of lax gun laws for the most part until here recently. Um, my job will be in Massachusetts. I went through all the hoops, all the jumps to get my legally riding um, firearms registered. The cops took my guns. I'm a law abiding citizen. They held them for six months before I could actually have them in my own house. Okay, I got it in a class A permit. I got my guns back. I went through all the background checks. Now, I previously went through those background checks in Colorado. I moved to this state. I brought my family. I brought my business specifically for the live free or die aspect of New Hampshire. A um, couple points. The doctor that was saying that this should be for the uh, children's safety and everything else. There are more malpractice suits for negligent deaths from doctors than there are for any firearms death. So if there should be anything that's regulated, it would be the doctors, which they are partly. The last point that I'd like to make is my, fam my family is here. The children are here. Now, there you go to school. Their teacher is armed. Both of them. Um, both my son Jack and Riley. Now, I'm not in fear of anything happening. So I look at this and see this is an example of a safe place. We homeschool. We have a right to protect ourselves. Just keep that in mind. Freedom is messy. So please try to do everything you can to respect the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Duvain, I'm sorry to uh, have uh, not asked you to speak before, but I understand you were willing to wait, so thank you for uh, being patient. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I rise in opposition of this bill for a number of reasons. Uh, first, I want to start off by saying I do not own a single assault weapon. I own defense weapons. That's what they are, defense weapons. Now, some people may look at some of the weapons and say they're ugly, they're offensive, or assault weapons, but they're not. The last thing I want to do is harm anybody, but I am not going to stand by and be a victim. This is why I own guns. For defense purposes and defense purposes only. Anybody who uses a gun offensively in a crime, they violate Part 1, Article 2A of our Constitution, which says that an individual has a right to keep and bear arms in defense of himself, his family, his property, and the state. Key word, defense. Second key word, state. Anywhere he can legally be. Now, I oppose this legislation because it is going to make criminals out of people who, like myself, would like to give my sons and daughters guns for Christmas, for their birthdays, okay? And I'm not going to stand by and be marked a criminal. This bill is nothing more than gun control, one law-abiding citizen at a time. And that's exactly, they can't do it all at once, so one law-abiding citizen at a time. And this is why I oppose this. Very dangerous. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. And Michelle Lavelle, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Michelle Lavelle. I am a New Hampshire coordinator for the Second Amendment Sisters. Uh, Second Amendment Sisters is a national organization that has thousands of members across the country. We believe that a woman's right to self-defense is a basic human right. Our membership in New Hampshire is one of the largest in the country, with many active women who enjoy firearm sports, but more importantly, we value our Second Amendment rights. I'm not going to go through my full written testimony since I've already submitted it, and many of those comments have already been made here at this hearing. But I did want to emphasize that caring parents can support Second Amendment rights and be in opposition of this bill. Um, SAS is a fabulously successful organization in New Hampshire. We have moms, grandmothers, 
daughters, including uh, girls under the age of 18, who come to our shoots every month. Every year we train new shooters. Uh, I believe this last year we trained over 300 new shooters, many of which did not come to our event with their own firearm. We give them the chance to try it out. Uh, as my friend Eileen Landis from the NHLA already mentioned, some of these women have found themselves to be widows and they're alone for the first time. Some people have been the victim of domestic assault situations. They need to learn how to protect themselves and SAS is one of those valuable opportunities that does not exist somewhere else. At SAS, we share our firearms with these ladies who come. Sometimes we have these events in private property. Would I become a felon for helping a woman learn how to protect herself? I would certainly hope not, because yeah, I'd be in big trouble. Uh, but I would urge this committee to think about the people who need to protect themselves, whether it's uh, a woman or uh, somebody else who otherwise could very easily be uh, victimized. Uh, so please, uh, ITL this bill, please think about the people who are protected by having the opportunity to uh, practice their firearms before they buy in a safe environment. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. It appears that uh, all of the rest of Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Sandler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for coming in. Um, so you're saying, in effect, that um, this law would, in effect, um, basically institutionalize discrimination against women? I believe it would. I think many women um, do not necessarily own firearms the first time they go shooting. I think many need that chance to try it out. Frankly, most firearms are built uh, for people much larger than me. Uh, imagine somebody who's closer to six foot and probably 200 some pounds. What fits comfortably in that person's hand is going to fit very differently in mine. And I can tell you personally, I valued that opportunity to try out some friends' handguns before I bought my own. And so yes, I think it, it is discriminatory because that opportunity to try before you buy, to try it out in a safe, supportive environment with people that um, are trained. Uh, is a valuable opportunity, and I would really hate to see that become a criminal offense. Thank you for that answer, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we still have about uh, 14, 16 people, all of whom are in opposition to the bill. So I will call you if you have something new to say, please do. Um, and if not, please consider uh, passing on your testimony. Uh, Mr. Popovich, Muller from Wyndham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honored members of the committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's kind of easy to uh, cover things that were uh, not covered before, seeing how there are so many problems with this bill that it would take us half an hour. It would take me half an hour easy to go over it. I promise not to even attempt that. Good. Let me start with um, addressing some of the remarks that uh, Senator Pierce made at the beginning. He said that he reconsidered his original support for gun rights when he was um, held up at gunpoint, and it was a very frightening experience for him. I think we are lucky that the gentleman was not held up with a knife, otherwise we would be looking at a cutlery bag. It's uh, not really a joke. UK, the country that uh, the main sponsor of the bill, Representative Andrews Ahern, uh, spent her high school for the DPRZ has not only banned guns, they banned knives to the point where if you are under 18, you cannot buy a bread knife in a store. And I can send you to the proper websites, official websites of the UK government to confirm that. We are talking bread knives. You can make a knife out of anything in a minute. Now, uh, talking, while we are on the topic of the UK, I would like to remind you that a few months ago there was an extremely sad incident in which a couple of uh, murderers used a hatchet to kill a UK uh, soldier that was returning to his base. Of course, according to the UK gun laws, the soldier was not armed since he was outside of his base. He was butchered on a public street in the middle of the day 
and the act took about 15 or 20 minutes with passerby going by, noticing the murder and then turning away and then not being able to intervene. Actually, at some points, the criminals gave ad lib interviews to people on cell phones explaining the political reasons behind the murder and whatnot. Would you see that happen in New Hampshire? God knows. It would take about five seconds for a person carrying a concealed weapon to end that criminal act. This is the type of safety that you are looking at when you are starting to restrict the gun ownership, Apologies. Gun ownership for law-abiding citizens. I would like to point to you that most people who came here to read their talking points against or in favor of this gun keep referring to gun violence. Is that what we need to look at? Every self-respecting criminologist will tell you that the correct way to measure the impact of legislation is to look at overall violence. Gun violence is but one way people hurt each other and criminals are criminals. They will hurt people. If you remove all the guns, Crime levels in the U.S. Violent crime, sorry, violent crime levels in the U.K. have increased after they passed their comprehensive legislation banning handguns. And of course, gun violence dropped. They just bashed each other with clubs, knives, bare hands, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> one of the uh, points that was uh, made here was that gun background checks are perfectly acceptable. After all, we do it for clergy. We do it for. Uh, lawyers, we do it for doctors, what's wrong with having a background check for a person? Well, first, I don't think there is a protected uh, constitutional right to be a doctor, but be that as it may, those background checks happen once, when you get your license. The equivalent of a background check as it is proposed in this legislation would be for a doctor or a clergy member or a lawyer to have a background check every time they go to argue a case or treat a patient or do anything else. Senator uh, Pierce also said that after all we have limitations on the First Amendment too. We cannot yell fire in a theater. Actually of course I can. I might be held liable if I cause a panic because there was no fire and I just looked for a drug. But there is nobody who will remove my ability to say fire, 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 if that is appropriate. A background check is, seems like a common sense measure, right? Oh, by the way, that's another phrase you must have heard 50 times. You're counting, people who are claiming that to be common sense are counting on people not understanding how wide the list of prohibited persons is. The legislation says background checks have blocked over 2,000, 2 million gun sales to to felons, domestic abusers, the severely mentally ill, and other dangerous people. Do you know how other dangerous people include anybody who used drugs at any point in their life? Now, I'm not saying that using drugs is a good habit, but it's hardly disqualified from the legal right to protect yourself. A marijuana conviction, which by the way is yet another example of a government prohibition that works really well, would disqualify people from being able to protect their lives ever. Wrap up your comments, please, sir. Yes, of course. We all agree that we are looking for safety. What happened in Sandy Hook was an unmitigated disaster. All those massacres that happened are a horrible, horrible thing, and we would all like for them to end. But if you look at the data, it clearly indicates that all massacres happened in gun-free areas. It seems like the logical approach that one should also consider is to eliminate gun-free areas completely. To conclude, the Colorado shooter chose his theater and bypassed 17 theaters that were closer to his house because that was the nearest theater that had a gun-free zone policy. All the other 17 theaters avoided the crime because they had a deterrent of armed law-abiding citizens and that prevents massacres. Gun-free zones do not. You cannot eliminate gun-free zones from the federal law, but by golly, you don't have to make, you know, help the feds make more of a mess of this than it is. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your testimony. Harrison Debris. Thank you, members of this committee. 
I would like to begin by making note that this bill will make a currently legal activity of letting a friend use your firearm under your supervision on your private property or on a sand pit you have permission to be, or anywhere you have permission to be, um, it will make it a, a Class B felony punishable by up to seven years in prison for each instance, each firearm you let someone use. I have done this myself many times for my friends who wanted to shoot my firearms. It would also make you guilty of a Class B felony if your girlfriend or boyfriend uses your firearm to defend themselves in a home invasion. Your girlfriend or boyfriend is not classified as a spouse. If I have a roommate, and I do, and I want him to use one of my firearms to protect himself if I'm away, I'm guilty of a Class B felony. And lastly, I would just like to say that the sponsor of this bill, Elaine Andrew Ahearns, did not write this bill. This bill was written for her by a group of elitist lawyers out of San Francisco, California. We are New Hampshire. We're our own state. We do not let San Francisco dictate our laws and public policy. This bill should be voted inexpedient to legislate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sydney, I'm sorry, Sydney, from Rochester. I can't uh, uh, figure out your last name. It's Fred Perry. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to try to make this quicker. I've thrown away what I was going to go, and I'm just going to go through some quick notes. I've noticed uh, from the other side, I've heard this, I'm frustrated, you know, we've been at this, and you don't listen, you know. I agree, I'm frustrated myself. It's the first time I stepped foot in here it was 25 years ago when Patrick Purdy shot the kids out in California. And we were told at that point in time by the sponsor of the bill that we didn't need a 20 round mag to shoot Bambi. That's the start of it. I've been coming back ever since trying to maintain my rights. Uh, the other thing is, from the other side, I've noticed that common sense and sensible are the term of the day. That if you do not agree with them, you must not have any common sense you must not be sensible. So I'm, from my perspective, going to try out, throw out some sensible stuff. Number one, the presenter of the bill gave us no account whatsoever of any crime that has happened that this bill would have stopped. None whatsoever. The follow-up person, the sponsor of the bill, gave us one from Wisconsin. Okay, one in Wisconsin, what's that got to do with New Hampshire? Uh, we've already gone over the internet thing, buying guns. I've been there myself. If you are selling out of state, over the internet, you have to go through registered dealers and all that. It's a farce. It's, there's nothing to it. The second thing is, everybody says, there is going to be no uh, consequences to us. Yeah, there is. There's a financial consequence by totaling up between my transfer amount and whoever buys the gun, you're talking 50 or 60 bucks. Once this gets forced in, I can see dealers out there raising that price up. There is a cost not only to the state to institute the program, but us, the poor citizen that's trying to do legal commerce. The background check, as everybody said, is not a New Hampshire check. It's a federal check. So even though you're not keeping records, I can guarantee you they are. Uh, to bring up the point that the last gentleman just said, I live with my girlfriend. We both have guns. They're locked in a safe together. If I'm not home, or she's not home, Who's responsible for them firearms? Yeah, where, where do you draw that line? You know, they're together, locked up in a safe where they should be. But we are not legally married. We're not spouses. Um, I'm also an NRA instructor. I uh, have been for years. I've lent guns 
to people. I've trained guns and everything else. A lot of that will go away. I will not be able to do that anymore without putting myself in jeopardy. And I really wish the people from uh, the same country would have stayed because I would like to give them my heartfelt sympathy. I cannot imagine what it's like for them to go through. But I also feel they're being used by the other side to push an agenda. And I would say that by doing you a hypothetical. Hypothetically, Adam Lanza goes out, kills a truck driver, takes his 18-wheeler, goes screaming into his school bus, kills 26 students and teachers. Would we be here today deciding how we're going to regulate the truck? Or would we be looking at what caused Adam Lanza to do it and start figuring out we got a real problem with ADHD, all these psychological things that they grew up with, and coming up with serotonin uptake inhibitors that we're feeding our kids left and right. That's all I get to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Chris Leone from Epping. Chair, members of the committee, thanks for, uh, thanks for having this hearing today and sticking it out. Um, a lot of what I wanted to say has already been touched upon, um, so I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, one thing that I just can't let go because it really bothered me that those people we hear from uh, Sandy Hooker, Connecticut today, my heart goes out to their families. Uh, the event is very tragic. I'm sorry that it happened, but... If anybody knows him, the shooter was denied three times a federal 4473 background check. Not once, not twice, three times before he committed the egregious crime of shooting his own mother, stealing her guns. Now this is a legend, and I say this is a legend because this comes from the media, which I do not trust, and it also comes as reports from the government, which I do not trust. So allegedly, this is what we've all been told. He shot his mother, stole her gun, walked into the school, and committed that tragedy. Now, that background check that he failed three times, legally, did nothing to prevent that crime. Yet, all these people can feel good about having to come up and, and explain this story, and I think this is better, it's going to save the children, it's going to do this for the community. It will do nothing related to this bill. So therefore, that testimony was really invalid, and anybody else that had that same train of thought has really invalid testimony pertaining to this bill. While it sounds really good, and some people need to say it because they need to feel good, it has zero, zero to do with this bill. So, I think I touched on that. Uh, and one more thing related to that, uh, the prime sponsor, Mrs. This, this Ahern from Portsmouth, um, she had made a comment that almost jumped out of my seat when I heard it. Background checks work. Okay, well, after what I just said, that gentleman at the scene that did the scene should Sandy Hook shooting failed three background checks and she had the audacity to say background checks work and then bring all those people up here to explain that. I find that repulsive. Uh, I think I said enough on that. Um, this bill is nothing but uh, registration. It's going to lead, it is registration. And I'd like to share with you a little, little something. Um, I wasn't going to say this, but when I came here and I saw all these people here, it kind of brought back a little bit of a memory. There's a group here that the prime sponsor of the bill, Ahern, uh, talked about, which was the Newcastle Promise. And they, she stated at this hearing that they came to her to get this bill, 1589, on the agenda before you, the representatives, to vote on. Now, what I want to tell you about is back last June or July, I may be off by a month, um, Newcastle Promise, this small group uh, for, against gun violence, published in the uh, Portsmouth Herald that they were going to hold a meeting uh, about gun violence and anybody from the public was welcome to come. Well, we saw that in the paper, and I, myself, and a few others in this room, and some that are not, attended that meeting in Newcastle. And uh, we had more people present than they did. Um, 
because we saw it in the paper. But what I wanted to tell you is that I have a copy of their meeting agenda and meeting minutes. Okay, now what was discussed at this meeting is pertinent to why we're all here today, because they talked about what they were going to do. I, I can't believe they did this with us in the room and passed out their agenda. I have it, which I am going to submit to every person in the committee. And now that this is out, I'm talking about it, we're also going to make this go viral. Try to make your point, sir. Exactly. Um, so, I have a copy of that meeting agenda that I'm going to give to each one of these committee members. Now, what was talked about in that meeting was this bill, gun confiscation, gun registration, the banning of assault weapons, the banning of high-capacity magazines, so on and so forth, that went for two pages. Now, they said, and they all agreed, talking in the room, that they could not come out and do this just blatantly come out and do it because the public, us, people that care about their rights and their liberties, would obviously freak out. And uh, obviously, plenty of us are here today explaining that, expressing that. But they said they were going to do it incrementally. Now, anybody that's been around, especially people that are elected representatives, know uh, incrementalism is what moves an agenda forward. Whether it's for your side, the other side, it doesn't really matter. Never let a good crisis go to waste. And incrementalism are the two things that are going to drive policy in this country, whether they're federal or the state. And what these people are trying to do is slowly, incrementally, little bit, bit by bit, they're going to try to get, ultimately, gun confiscation, gun, reg gun, gun registration, which always leads to gun confiscation. It's a fact throughout history. And they're trying to do it, and you will see that in their, in their agenda that I am going to share with you within the next couple of days. Could you uh, wrap up your comments, please? Sure. Thank you for moving me along. Last thing I want to bring up, which I only heard two people so far discuss this. The fiscal, the last page of the last couple of pages of the bills of fiscal note. This right here should say ITL to this bill. Okay? Two hundred thousand dollars estimated. Now I want to also point out that there's three parts here that I have highlighted, which they say estimate. They can't even give you an accurate estimate of what the estimate should be. And it states that right here. The Department of Corrections states is not able to determine the fiscal impact. Next one, the association is unable to determine the number of individuals that may be charged or incarcerated. But yet we have a price tag here of $200,000. Out to 2018, which is only four years away, $400,000. This is only an estimate. Well, where are you going to come up for this money? Uh, one of the representatives, I forget who it was, asked the uh, prime or co-sponsor of the bill that question earlier. Where are you going to come up with that money? Oh, well, I think we can find it. Please tell me where we're going to find it because I don't want it to come out of my taxes anymore. I want zero, none, no more taxes, zero. But yet we're going to pass this and we're going to incur another four hundred thousand dollars of estimated cost on our state. As a excuse me, sir, thank you. Um, as representatives, you have to look at that. Where is the money going to come from? And based on that, where we don't have any money and we don't have any additional funds to play with to institute registration, which leads to confiscation, we should ITL this bill. Thank you for your testimony, sir. We have several more people to go, and it's almost 5 o'clock. Sir, I appreciate it, but I sat here just as long as you did, and uh, I'm prepared to give my, my testimony. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I was done, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, William Johnson from Guilford. Uh, or Bill Oakley, o Oakley from Nashville. Penny Dean from Concord. Thank you for your patience. You're welcome, sir. Whoops. My name is Penny Dean. I'm a private attorney, and I'm licensed to practice in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and a bunch of other places. And I'm calling because I'm not afraid of this bill because I don't understand it. I understand it perfectly, and I'm terrified of it. I think whoever drafted it clearly didn't understand anything about New Hampshire law, let alone federal firearms law. There are more defects in here than the committee has time to listen to. 
I hope you're going to ITL this bill, but if you're not going to, I'm a working attorney and I'm happy to come to your work sessions and help you through this and hope you hopefully convince you that you do need to ITL the bill and I'll pass out cards so you'll have my number. I think it's important when you look at this bill, probably one of the most egregious ones without going to, into the mechanics of what's wrong with the bill that everyone else has talked about, is on page three, it's 159E2, Roman 2A. And from a federal firearms licensee's attorney's point of view, what this bill is suggesting is that they violate federal law. And I can tell you, if a federal firearms licensee does what it suggests in this paragraph, I would suggest that the next week the ATF would be revoking their license. Because the problem is that what this bill says is if I'm going to sell a firearm, and I go into Riley's and they check in my firearm, which means he puts it in his bound book, and we're waiting for the buyer to clear, that they're letting me take it back. That's a violation of law every day of the week. I can tell you right now that the ATF reads this and they'd say, oh, that's really nice, but you can't supersede federal law. And so what you're doing is essentially being an accessory before the fact to federal firearms licensees violating federal law. That's not a good thing. But as we go through the bill more and more and more, we look at many other provisions where whoever drafted this simply doesn't have a rudimentary knowledge of federal law. And they certainly don't know anything about firearms and how firearms are used by people. What this bill does is make a firearm a uniquely personal object, which it actually treats it essentially like what's called class three firearms, which are um, fully automatic firearms and suppressors and everything else. That's a, a, a fact, basically, of what's happening here. And more importantly, they're treating frames. Frames are included here. There's a lot of other things when you actually read what's included here that really will surprise you. And it, it would just destroy the fabric of New Hampshire. Um, Massachusetts, who has one of the most egregious gun laws in the country, doesn't even do this. They have an FA-10 form that you voluntarily fill out within 10 days of selling firearms in a private sale. But to say that our laws would be more draconian than Massachusetts, can't even believe it. And I can happily answer all sorts of questions for the committee about mechanics, you know, or, or anything about how the bill would be implemented. And like I said, I'll give you cards with numbers on because I really am happy to come to your working group. Thank you. Um, there will be a subcommittee, and we will have to go through this bill relatively quickly in order for it to go to the House and uh, on to the Criminal Justice uh, Committee if it gets that far. So I suspect that... Uh, Within the next week, we'll have another. We'll have a subcommittee meeting, and uh, that will be posted. So, uh, just keep an eye on the bill. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, is it uh, Mitch Apkar no. uh, from Helen? I'm sorry. What's your last? Uh, I didn't see the K. Is it horrible writing? Yes, I was. I wrote that pretty quickly. Sorry. Uh, my name is Mitch Kopez. I am uh, here representing gun owners of New Hampshire, which is thousands of firearms owners in the state of New Hampshire. Um, I, I'd like to say a couple of things at the end of my testimony about the procedures and what I've seen here today. Uh, I've been testifying here for 25 years, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I want to say is common sense. Common sense. That's what we're talking about here today. Where have all these crimes occurred? Gun-free zones. What's common sense? How do you solve that? You make them not gun-free zones. I was interviewed after Sandy Hook, and some and by a reporter who came to me to ask me, what do you think could have been done to solve the Sandy Hook problem? And, and I don't say this in, to be black humor or a joke, but I said, well, we need bigger signs. And she said, what do you mean bigger signs? I said, well, obviously he didn't see the sign that said this is a gun-free zone. That's the stupidity of this legislation. You're suggesting by passing a law that someone's going to obey it. A criminal. A criminal is a criminal. I.e. they don't obey laws. So that's what's going to happen from this. Uh, common sense. Israel. One school shooting in the history of Israel. Has anybody heard of a school shooting in Israel? The terrorist capital of the world? Do you know what they did? One school shooting, every teacher was trained on how to use a, a firearm, and they use semi-automatic and, and automatic firearms. All teachers are trained, and they're armed with firearms in schools. And guess what? There's no more school shootings in Israel. 
Is that common sense? No, let's put a bigger sign up that says, so everybody can read it, say gun-free zone. We leave our children in a gun-free zone. This building is not a gun-free zone. This is protected by, by security and, and state police officers with firearms. Yet our schools are not protected. And, they, and the people that came here from Sandy Hook, though I sympathize with their problem or the issue that happened with their children, um, as it did, I think it's a horrible and, and, and tragic incident. I think to use them as a prop, which I believe is illegal in, in uh, testimony in this, in this room, we are not allowed to use props. Am I correct on that? Or Yes, that was a prop. The second prop I saw used was somebody holding an egg, who admittedly admitted it was illegal to possess in the United States of America. And I hope she's arrested downstairs by the state police. Or someone from here had her arrested because you heard her say she's holding a legal item in the United States. Yet, we just let that happen, that's okay. We had to be in firearms. As, as I look through this further, 1968 Gun Control Act, last gun control we'll ever need in the country. Brady Bill, last gun control act we'll ever need in this country. Nick Check, last gun control act we'll ever need in this country. Gun free school zones will keep our children safe. Common sense. This bill is a solution without a problem. And as I look through here, what you're doing, or what, if, if you pass this bill, you'll be creating felons of honest, law-abiding citizens. Uh, transfer between immediate family members. What about stepchildren? I don't see them in here. So if I have a stepchild, I cannot transfer that firearm to that stepchild because we will both become felons. And when we're both felons, what happens? We can no longer possess firearms. Two more gone. Don't tell me this isn't a progressive way to ban guns in this country. Temporary transfer of a firearm between a spouse for the purpose of immediate self-defense provided. Transfer only lasts as long as immediately necessary. Well, who in here thinks uh, they need their firearm always? Okay, there we go. So immediately necessary, who decides that? Cut, and, and then, um, uh, the next one after that is uh, for shooting. Shooting ranges by authorized governing body. This kills me, all this government stuff in here. What governing body? Is that the shooting range government body? Or is that the government of the town? Do I have to go get a permit from the board of selectmen or the mayor to have a shooting event at my shooting range? Or do I get it from the governing body of the shooting range? So it's not clear really what's going on in here. So this is a lawyer's dream to pass this bill for, for people to... Uh, keep them from being felons. And oh, by the way, this is also uh, only $756 per felony for someone that can't afford an attorney. I'm sure, I'm sure there's an attorney here that can tell you what it would cost to, to defend a felony. It would be in the neighborhood of five to $10,000 easily. And we're going to give them $750. Another felon, another gun gone. So, uh, Ending, the, the, one, the two things I want to say is, is I'm outraged that props were allowed to be used in this room that's never happened before, that a break was taken that's never been allowed to be done before. I'm here on, on my own dime, my own time. Everybody sitting here is here on their own dime, in their own time. And you take a break. I have never in 20 years seen a break taken from this room, ever. I see, I see representatives gone home. Gee, it must be late. I think they get, they're supposed to be here to hear this. I'm, I'm outraged. I'm, I, I cannot believe what I'm seeing here. So as a citizen of this country, that, or this state, that has testified here again for at least 25 years, uh, this is the first time I've ever seen this happen in this hall. And, and, and I am outraged. And as are those people that, that are standing behind you, that, of this attack on the freedom of, of the state of New Hampshire. Uh, God bless America. God bless New Hampshire. Yay. And uh, relative to your concern about how the uh, uh, hearing was conducted, if you want to write to the leadership of the House, they will... Uh, oh, I will. And I have to do that. So so I will thank you. I appreciate that. But that was, just so you know, props have never been not allowed in here, ever. And, and those two things were props. Sandy Hook people and that little lady. And I, I want to hear about that lady being arrested. And... Uh, James Gaffney from Warner. Hello, how are you, Mr. Oh, how are you? Uh, honestly, pissed off. 
I'm not going to hide it. It's the end of the day. I've been here for half a day. I took a whole day off work to come talk to you people. Some of you who I recognize and have watched your voting records, you know, over time. Some of you work very hard to defend our liberty, freedom, and private property rights. Others of you don't fall into that category. You work to trample our rights. You work to trample our freedoms. You work to trample our private property and sir, our private property rights. Please, uh, speak to the bill. Thank I am you. speaking to the bill, sir. Thank you. It's cost me and everybody else that came down here an exorbitant amount of money and time out of our lives to defend our rights from a minority or maybe a slight majority of you people. I, I, what is this? It's a thumb. What does that make me? A tool user. What's a gun? A gun's a tool. What's a pen? It's a tool. What's a chainsaw? It's a tool. I, I could use any of these things to, to inflict harm on a person in a multitude of ways. So could anybody else. A, a gun is just an inanimate object. It, it doesn't, in and of itself, doesn't do anything. It's the person that has to take an action with the tool in order for something good or bad to happen. So what is this bill? This bill isn't about gun control. This bill is about people control. It stuns me that so few people are so incapable of looking at what's gone around, not only around the United States, but around the world. There's example after example after example of what happens when you restrict the rights of, of individuals. The, the rights to possess firearms. What happens? Inevitably, crime goes up. You not only criminalize good people, but you increase the black market. Well, what happened with, you know, prohibition? Well, overnight, we criminalized hundreds of thousands of millions of people. We made criminals out of them. What happened? The law of unintended consequences. Organized crime. All you have to do is look at Washington, D.C. Everything has to be registered, but they have more murders than, than virtually any other city or municipality in the nation. Look at Baltimore, same thing. Look at L.A., same thing. Hell, Illinois. You know, if, if you want to make things worse, pass a law about it trying to control people. It's guaranteed to make things worse. Your jobs are to protect our liberty, our freedom, and our private property rights. And that's really it. And that's what I'd like to see you people start doing. Some of you do a great job of it, and thank you very much. You know, you know I want to make sure kudos goes where kudos should be going. But some of you people are, work actively, constantly, recruiting people from other states to come here and try to pass their legislation in our state. I'm agitated. It's obvious. I wear my heart on my sleeve. No BS. I'm not going to hide it. I get tired of coming here year after year after year, spending gobs and gobs and gobs of, gobs of money to no point. It, do, it doesn't go into the economy. It's wasted. It's pissed away, if you'll excuse my language. Just to come here year after year, bill after bill, to defend my rights from, from you people. Uh, it, it's silly. I, I'm frustrated. You know, it, it's got to stop. You guys need to start looking at each other and saying, you know what? This isn't a good idea. This has been done in Illinois. Didn't work. It's been done in Maryland. Didn't work been done in California. didn't work. You know, you, you can list 30, 40 states where it's been done. didn't work. didn't work in Mexico. Hasn't worked in Europe. The more you restrict, hell, I'll go back even further. What happened in Scotland seven, eight hundred years ago? The British banned swords. Hell, they even banned bagpipes. What happened? People started training with the next lethal thing. Sticks, stones, Big rocks. What did we get? We got the Scottish Highland Games. So, you know what? You can ban guns. You can control guns. It's not going to solve the problem. You're just going to end up controlling people. You're going to get more violence <coughs> with other objects. 
People are going to use their thumbs and they're going to go to the next best tool. So do me a favor, leave us alone. You know, simply put, just leave us alone. You know, every year, this time of year comes around, I get frustrated, you know, it, and there, there's truth to it. You know, the, the greatest threat to freedom and liberty is a legislation, legislative body in session. I can't wait till you guys go home. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony, sir. Susan DeLimas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee who have chosen to stick around. For the record, my name is Susan DeLimas. I'm from Rochester, New Hampshire. Proud of it. Um, I'm also a certified NRA pistol safety instructor. And uh, it just, so many good testimonies have come up here. And I'm hoping that the people who would like this bill to pass would really think about, seriously consider all the things that have been said today for those who have come for ITL, and I am here for ITL. Um, and it seems that every single time that there's any violent, uh, violence perpetrated by someone who chooses to use a firearm, there's an immediate knee-jerk reaction. And I know other people have said that. Um, but it's done by the lawmakers who attempt to strip the uh, rights of law-abiding citizens. It makes no sense whatsoever. Um, those citizens own their firearms for their personal protection and the protection of their children and for hunting and competitions. Now, I've had a background check taken recently because my mom is here with me today and I am taking care of her now and I had to go through a, a background check. I am a law-abiding citizen. You know, uh, did any of the people that were mentioned by one of the other people who gave testimony about the headlines of all the crimes that have gone on, were, did any of those people have a criminal background? We don't know. The authorities, I'm going to go back to uh, Sandy Hook, on December 16th in 2012, the authorities offered a few details about Mr. Lanza. Um, his aunt said that he was never in trouble with the law and never in trouble with anything. Uh, we do know that he enjoyed uh, soccer, skateboarding, and violent video games. He was even described as a genius. You know, maybe we should perhaps uh, think about prohibiting violent video games instead of people's rights to carry arms and do it safely. There are avenues people can take to learn how to use firearms very safely because that's what it's all about is safety. I really encourage you guys to ITL. It's a... Uh, it really is a, a common sense thing to do. And I know that was mentioned. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We have just two more people to uh, testify. And if we could hear from Christopher Booth from Concord. My name is Christopher Booth, and for the record, I am strongly opposed to the bill. I'm going to be, try to be as blunt as possible. Are we all stupid? We live in a culture. There's probably a couple of people here who are old enough to have lived through Prohibition, 1919 to 1933. Today we're in the culture of drug prohibition, the drug wars. If you look through 1850, 18, whenever it started, through 1980, early 1980s, the number of people that New Hampshire put in prison fit in this room. They wouldn't use up the, uh, the, side, the side chairs either. It was less than 250, 300 people. Now, today, 2,799. Why? Because some moron 
thought that it would be a good idea to make sentences longer and to put people into prison for silly things like possessing a plant that's no da more dangerous than a dandelion or a raspberry. Fortunately, we're seeing the end of that drug war coming. We have two teams in the Super Bowl who are from the only states in the country that allow marijuana to be purchased legally. Mr. Booth? Yeah. Can you focus your uh, yeah. comments, please? I want to I want to address human rights, but but first I, I want to point out the the most obvious thing. Every time somebody proposes anything to do with registration of guns, banning guns, anything, it's unconstitutional. It goes nowhere, and it doubles the sales of guns. Are you stupid? You know, do you want to increase the sale of guns? Go ahead and propose something that's unconstitutional. Now, as to human rights, do you have the right to defend yourself? Do you have the right to try to improve yourself? Do you have the right to speak? What are human rights? Well. There's, there's a few rights that are delineated in our Bill of Rights in the Constitution. That doesn't give us those rights. And in fact, if you look at the Second Amendment, which says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, that doesn't even say that we have the right to keep and bear arms. But it says that if we did have the right of the people to keep and bear arms, it shall not be infringed. Well, is it an infringement to require a background check? Absolutely. If I fail a background check, I'm still entitled to that weapon. If I have a right to that weapon, I have a right to that weapon. You cannot give somebody a right. You cannot take a right away from them. Does Michael Addison have the right to defend himself right now in prison? Absolutely. Does he have the right to have a 50 caliber machine gun in his cell with him? That would be debatable. Most people would say no. Anyway, the, the, uh, there is a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that, that lists a whole bunch of, of human rights that people have. The right to defend yourself is not in there. I put it in there. I, I added it. I added it. <laughs> but the right to defend yourself is definitely a, a right. And I want, to, I want to explain what the New Hampshire Constitution says. The New Hampshire Constitution says all persons, that's Michael Addison, that's you, that's me, that's everybody, have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and their state. Now, that sentence does not give people any rights. It recognizes that all persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and their state. Now, what does a background check do, though? Now, if I go to the Walmart and and I buy a, a gun and bring it here and, you know, take some pot shots of politician that I don't like, and Walmart gets sued for selling me the gun, you know, because they say, you know, he just got out of, out of, out of state prison, you know, last week, and you should have done a background check on him. You shouldn't have sold him the gun. Walmart's a real deep pocket. They'll be sued for billions of dollars. But Walmart has this indemnity that they can say, no, well, we use a background check, you know. But the background check is voluntary because I, if I have a right to a weapon, I have a right to a weapon. And you cannot take that away from me. Any, anyway, that's, that's the thing that I want to point out. All background checks are clearly unconstitutional. They're voluntary, 
And you, you, this, this, I mean, this committee is going to vote on this bill. It's going to, if, if I listen to the testimony, I would, I would go right to yell on it. Mr. But, Booth. But we'll see what happens. Um, thank you. Uh, I think we understand your point. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. And last, and I'm sure not least, Dr. Hannon. Hannon from Lee. Hi, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody uh, staying as long as they have, those of you who stayed. My name is Dr. Joseph Hannon from Lee, New Hampshire. And uh, I'd like to apologize. Uh, it's more of a confession. I did not go through a background check before coming up here to speak today. So I, uh, I just want to put that out there. I know we are talking about exercising a right. This isn't about guns or weapons or saving lives. This is about rights. And governments are instituted, our government is here to, to protect our rights. There was a landmark case years ago in Minnesota, Near versus Minnesota, and we went to the Supreme Court. It was a First Amendment case that uh, discussed, uh, very briefly, it talked about a, um, it was a case about a publisher who was publishing malicious and scandalous content about a um, public official. Uh, the Supreme Court stated that officials are, are in their ruling, they are, there, they are supposed to punish the abuse of a right and not place prior restraints on the exercise of that right. They couldn't take every person who publishes a newspaper and read it first. They can't take someone who wants to go open up a church and make sure they're a good church. The prior restraint is getting that approval. Now, we've heard a lot of discussion about people that are doctors. I, I practice many years, we have another doctor, we have several doctors who talked about it, lawyers, and uh, we even heard about a clergy person having to get a background check. Well, the, the lawyers and doctors have to go to the state for a background check for the privilege of practicing a profession that they had to earn. This is not a right. Not everyone in here has a right to be a doctor or a lawyer, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but that's something that has to be earned. It's a privilege. And the difference between privileges and rights is the key to this discussion. There's a privilege to drive a car on a public way in the state. You have to take a test, get a license, and drive. You can be a drunk driver convicted 10 times of drunk drink, drinking and driving, but if your license is taken away, you still have the right to buy a car. 30,000 people a year are killed from driving under the influence, people with alcohol-related deaths in this country. It's almost three times the murder rate in this country. But it doesn't even occur to anyone to get these people barred for life from ever buying a car. You can get killed 10 people, go to jail, come out after 40 years from drunk driving. You can't buy a gun because you've been a convicted felon, convicted felon, alcoholic, but you can buy a car, you can buy booze. Um, the, the argument might be made that speech and religion are not necessarily as dangerous as the right to bear arms. And I'd like to mention a few facts to give you a little background on why that is not the case. Um, 1997, Heaven's Gate cult. There were 39 people dead. It would have been, at the time, it would have been the fit, if it was a shooting, it would have been the fifth most danger, uh, lethal event in history. 1978, the People's Temple, Jim Jones. You've probably heard about drinking the Kool-Aid. Over 900 people died. 9-11, 2001, 19 terrorists killed nearly 3,000 civilians with box cutters. I won't even get into the Crusades and all these other things, but we know that religion can be dangerous. Nobody's suggesting we should license religion. Even the reverend who was talking about licensing and having to go through it and she'd love to get a light, you know, background check, I'm pretty sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, that this was someone who had to go through her own church's policy Church's procedures to get a background check through our private church. The Boy Scouts do it. To be a Cub Scout leader, I had to get a background check voluntarily. I'm sure that any reverend or pastor or priest would be appalled and would be screaming at the top of their lungs here right now if the proposal was to have government-mandated checks for any of these things. So the difference, privileges, rights, personal responsibility. We hear about we have a responsibility to our community, to our citizens, and to our children. I have two small children, and one of them, when he was a baby, was we were attacked, and I defended myself, and him, and my wife, and he's alive because of the firearm. I had to go through the background check. I had to go through all this stuff to get it. 
But what if I'd been denied? And it does happen. In 2008, just as one example, there was an octogenarian in Delaware who was denied by the chief of police to purchase a firearm because, and in his words, I'm paraphrasing, but she was too old and a woman. Ooh, yeah. The fact that there is a bureaucrat somewhere who is in an office answering the phone to make this decision is the difference between someone living or dying. Now, you can say they can appeal it. Well, if I'm 80-some years old, and it might take how many months to appeal, that could be a death sentence for someone who needs it. The, um, the last part I, I'll go into, I'll, I'll try, I won't be, I'm trying to be brief, but I promise you I'll be last. Uh, there are several things that's, that are, make this law pretty much a toothless law. The General, the General Accounting Office had a study years ago that said that every time a fictitious person, that someone used a fictitious driver's license to pass a background check at a legal dealer, 100% of the time in their study, the person was able to pass the background check regardless of their history. They just had to come up with a name that wouldn't be in the system, get an ID, and hand it off, and go and do it. The other problem is straw purchases. Now, we've heard a lot of testimony about we have to stop the illegal gun trade and all this stuff. The problem with that is it's already up, up against the law to do that. You can't buy a gun to give it to your brother that's illegal, even if that person is allowed. Now, under this law, you can buy a gun and give it to your brother, but under federal law, you're not allowed to buy a gun for the purpose of giving it to another individual. If you're buying it for the purpose of giving it away and conducting a sale or a transaction, that's against the law. The Journal of American Medical Association, a, a, a journal that's not necessarily friendly to uh, gun rights in the past, uh, two years after the Brady background checks were instituted, determined that they found that it failed to reduce the murder rates and implementing waiting periods and background checks did not experience, that did not lead to a reduction in homicide rates or overall suicide rates. And it has not stopped killings. So, with all of these things to consider, I think we have to remember we've been promised this isn't registration, this isn't uh, an infringement of our rights, that is a lie. We've heard this before, and to paraphrase, uh, the people that are presenting this bill are saying, in a sense, if you like your guns, you can keep them. Well, we've heard that before. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. And thank you, everyone, for your patience, uh, to committee members for your focus and uh, uh, consideration of this bill. All of the bills that are presented to the legislature have to be heard, whether we support them or not. Um, and we will uh, pursue this bill through subcommittee and uh, to the floor of the House soon. Thank you very much.